The 2019 Hopkinton Annual Town Meeting will come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and let's observe a moment of silence for those town employees and volunteers who have passed away since our last town meeting. As we get started, please be sure that you have a copy of the handouts which have been provided in the corridor outside of the auditorium. Counters uh, within the hall have been assigned under the, under the direction of our deputy town moderator, Ellen Rutter. And uh, I'll take a moment at this point to call for an affirmation of Ellen serving this town meeting as deputy once again. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Rules of the meeting, bounds of the hall. Non-voters should have a paper pass and be seated on the first few rows on stage right. Media members sit in the first row center. Please no standing in the aisles during the meeting other than to address the meeting. Eating and smoking are not permitted in the hall and please mute your cell phones. Only registered voters are entitled to sit in the voting areas of the auditorium. Exceptions are limited to town council and to those town employees who are participating in the meeting. Anyone who wants to speak should rise, come to a microphone, and ask to be recognized by the moderator. When recognized, please state your name and street address. Be clear in stating your position. Keep your comments brief and on point. Rambling and unfocused discussion will fall on deaf ears. Only those who are recognized by the moderator can speak, and they should stop when asked by the moderator. The speakers making opening presentations on the major budget articles will have 10 minutes each to speak. Other article sponsors will have three, three minutes to make their presentations. Other speakers in the audience will have two minutes, unless the moderator allows an extension of time. A speaker may have a second opportunity to speak only when all others have had a chance to enter the discussion. Any and all discussion must be directed strictly to the article that is under consideration. All questions go through the moderator and we do not allow debating. Please do not stand other than to address the moderator or to vote when called upon. If you are proposing an amendment you must state it at a microphone. It must be written legibly and presented both to the amendment desk at the back of the hall so that it can be displayed on the screen and to the moderator. Please be respectful of meeting members' time and have your written amendment ready as quickly as possible. Finally, remember that we are neighbors before the meeting and will continue to be neighbors after the meeting. We are here participating for the betterment of our town. Let's maintain our civility and keep our minds open to persuasion. Contrary viewpoints strengthen our understanding of the items before us, and debate will enrich us, and through our discussions, we will find the best course of action for the town. We are now ready to start the meeting. I call on our town clerk, Connor Degan, to come forward for the return, call and return of the warrant. Greetings to the constables of the town of Hopkinton, in the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You are hereby required to notify and warn all inhabitants of the town of Hopkinton, qualified to vote in elections and in town affairs, of the annual town meeting warrant this day, Monday, May 6, 2019. Hereof fail not and make the due return of this warrant with your doings thereon to the clerk of said town of Hopkinton at the time and place aforesaid given under our hands this sixth day of May, 2019. 
Thank you, Connor. I now call on Claire Wright, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, for a motion on the customary procedures relating to the time of this evening's meeting. Um, I would recommend that we adjourn the meeting at 11 p.m. or at the conclusion of the article um, leading into that hour. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Then it's unanimous. Mr. Moderator, I also have a recommendation on the ordering of two of the articles. Is now the appropriate time? Yes, it is. Um, I would recommend that Article 53 concerning the Kalala Farm Road Sewer be taken uh, after Article 22, the Sewer Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, because these articles are um, somewhat related. Okay. Is there any discussion relating to the movement of that Article 53 to follow Article 52? Seeing none, all those in favor of moving, moving Article 53? After 22, I'm excuse sorry, me. For 22. Article 53, after Article 22. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, does anyone else have any change in order to propose with respect to the Warren Articles? Okay, seeing, seeing none, then. We will move to Article 1, Acceptance of Town Reports. Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And we move that the town accept the reports of the town officers, boards, and committees. OK. Uh, there are <clears throat> several boards that would like to make short presentations. And we'll start with the Board of Health, Lisa Whittemore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my name is Lisa Woodamore. I am currently serve as the chair of the Board of Health. I'd like to take a few moments to share with the town some of the accomplishments that the Board of Health has made over the last year. None of these would be possible without the amazing group of employees within the department. Sean McAuliffe, the director, Nadia Roberti LaRoche, the administrative support, Brian Besso, the health agent, we are also supported by some contract employees who manage specific programs. We passed a ban on plastic bags that is modeled on the bill that is currently in the state legislature. We increased the age of to 21 and banned the sale of products that are flavored. Our health director, Sean Schools and the Youth and Family Services to create a best in class harm reduction model in our schools to support students who are using nicotine-based materials and ensuring that they receive education and, as appropriate, get into treatment quickly. Hopkinton has been recognized by the State Department of Public Health as a model for other towns in the Commonwealth. Sean has also partnered with UMass to develop a program that supports testing of ticks to reduce the spread of tick-borne illness in the community. He has been asked to speak at multiple venues to report in the program that started here. Hopkinton is a tick town. As residents, you have access to testing of any ticks you find on yourself or your children for a reduced fee of $15. We have recently, in collaboration with the fire department, police department, and senior center, entered into a contract with ClearPath, who will provide services to our residents who struggle with maintaining their homes and need support to declutter. The Board of Health has also continued to do our day-to-day -day business, working with the staff to update the regulations, manage Title V-related business, conduct hearings on tobacco sales violations, and develop a strategic plan to help us move forward over the coming year. I'd like to acknowledge my fellow board members, Mike King, Vice Chair, and Jennifer Flanagan, who is finishing her three-year term. We look forward to continue to serve you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Now I'd like to call on the representative from the Volunteer Recognition Committee, Bob Levinson. <coughs> uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Bob Levinson. I'm at 13 Smith Road. And on behalf of the members of the Volunteer Recognition Group, which is uh, Dottie Ferreter Wallace, Gene Birchman, and Rick Flannery, I'd like to inform my fellow citizens here in Hopkinton about a process we now have for recognizing the substantial amount of volunteering that happens in the community. We now have a formal way to do this, and uh, it's pretty simple, and we encourage you all to, uh, to try this. Uh, if, if there is someone you feel who has made significant accomplishments and or has sustained involvement as an unpaid, a true volunteer for the town, uh, something they've done over time that adds to the quality of life here in Hopkinton, uh, we ask you to go to the town's website uh, and uh, look for the form that's out there prominently. It says Volunteer Recognition Nomination Form. It'll take you about two minutes to fill it out. And uh, once you do, it'll be submitted, and um, all forms will be reviewed by our group, along with a group of uh, town officials. And any nomination that's approved will be forwarded to the Board of Selectment for formal public recognition. Uh, this is open to all town res residents and out-of-towners who volunteer for in-town groups and or activities. Uh, to date, 63 of your fellow Hopkinton citizens have been recognized uh, by the Board of Selectmen. All honorees are listed on the uh, town website and archived there. And uh, we urge you to take a few minutes and use this method to thank your fellow citizens for the wonderful amount of volunteering to make Hopkinton what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> now I call on Gene Birchman to speak to the top of the hill. Thank you. I'm Jean Birchman, and I'm here representing the Top of the Hill Committee, which um, includes representation from the Hopkinton PTA, the Hopkinton HES, the Chamber of Commerce, the Hopkinton administration staff, and students. Um, the Hopkinton Top of the Hill nomination program started in 2015 and recognizes high school, uh, Hopkinton High School or Keith Tech alumni who graduated at least 10 years ago and who have demonstrated a high level of achievement and made significant contributions to work, home, community, or volunteer efforts. Um, we have two invitations for you tonight. One is that you will find these nomination forms on the tables in the hall, and we invite you to nominate anybody that you think is worthy of this recommendation, this, excuse me, this record recognition. The deadline is May 31st. Um, and then I also would, would like to invite all of you to come to the next induction ceremony, which will be November 26th at the high school. Uh, honorees will be invited back to spend the day in the high school speaking with students and sharing their experience and learning what it's like to be a high school student in 2019. Um, so I would just wanted to end with telling you who the 17 honorees have been so far. Many of them are in this room, so if they're not too shy to wave or stand up, um, we, can, we can see that they're here. In 2015, we inducted Paul Phipps, Mary Harrington, Tom McIntyre, Denise Millard, Megan Fennelly Altador, and Sean Terry. In 2016, we inducted George Brown, Walter Brown, Fred Harris, Mike Shepard, Kelly Grill, Sonny Bevel, and Libby McDonald Bischoff. And in 2017, we inducted Mike Whalen, Scotty Mackin, Josh Hanna, and Sarah Ellum. So thank you very much, and please, please nominate people um, for this great honor. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And the final presentation under Article One is by Joe Markey, the Marathon School Building Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, also Rebecca Roback uh, from the Appropriation Committee, who also has been serving on the Marathon Elementary School Building Committee, is uh, going to join me. Thank you. Um, so you should see a slide up here uh, in a moment uh, showing a picture of the school and then uh, some highlights of the numbers. Do we have that up there? 
the, the committee asked us to give this update because over the past several years, uh, town meeting has been very uh, instrumental in the success of this project. So the school opened in September 2018, and uh, we want to report back on the financial status of the project and the enrollment figures. So uh, thank you all who participated in prior votes in 2015 and 16 to make this project possible, and again in early 2017. Uh, shown here in the total amount budgeted is a $47 million figure. That includes the land purchase. It includes the additional 1.5 for the four additional classrooms that we incorporated when the enrollment figures uh, proved it necessary. And uh, of that, we project, we've spent most of and project by the end of the project, we're kind of at that tail, long tail end of the invoices rolling in, that we will have spent 43 million of that. That means that overall, the uh, amount that you appropriated turned out we spent four million less than that. So we're not returning a check to you, but it, what it means is the town will not have to borrow as much as you had once authorized the town to borrow. So I want to thank the whole committee for that. Uh, we had a great project team. The economic conditions were favorable when you did the bid process. The committee and the project manager were helpful in kind of fine tuning the project. And that's what kept us four million under. So great kudos to the team. Uh, how much has the state contributed? Uh, as you recall, this project was run through the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, they have uh, promised a grant at the beginning of this. We just said they'd help contribute up to $14 million to date. And again, we haven't processed all the final invoices yet, but to date they've reimbursed already 13 million of that. Uh, that represents to the total project costs, including the land purchase, the full number of classrooms, uh, above 30% contribution from the state. So we thank the state for their uh, help and contribution financially. Uh, there's also been a lot of talk about growth in the community, and I'm here to provide facts and figures to guide those conversations. Uh, the K through one enrollment during the final year at Center School was 473 students. Uh, this year, as of May 1st, 2019, currently at, at Marathon School, K and one enrollment is 504 students. So we have seen some increase. Uh, the average class size as of May 1st, 2019, for kindergarten is 21, and for first grade is 19. So again, those are uh, some of the key figures uh, that we're happy to report back to town meeting. Uh, there's been a number of people that contributed. I especially want to thank Mike Shepard, John Weaver, Rob Nickerson, who along with myself serves as the core team. We also had help from a number of people like Rebecca from Appropriations and her predecessor and the school committee and other committees and, and staff in town. Uh, so thank you for your help. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, members of the committee. Okay, I think we're ready for a vote uh, on Article 1. All those in favor of accepting the, the town reports of town officers, boards, and committees signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 2, Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Uh, Mr. Manning, appropriations. So Article 2, uh, we move the, uh, so we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially this is uh, a 2019 supplemental appropriations and transfers and we have a transfer basically for snow and ice, which is for 2019, which is 525,000 from certified free cash. And then there's a funding source for the, uh, uh, the enterprise, enterprise fund uh, to replace certified earnings, which is $70,000 to the sewer enterprise fund. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, then <clears throat> all those in favor of Article 2, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Article 3, unpaid bills from previous fiscal years. And Board of Selectmen? Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning? Uh, we move the motion 
as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is, uh, we had some previous unpaid bills from previous years, uh, totaling uh, $2,352.32. And uh, this is from uh, free cash that we'll be paying for this. Any questions on this article? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Article four, property tax exemption increase. Board of Selectmen? The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning again. So Article 4, property tax <laughs> exemption increase. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is uh, a property tax increase for uh, basically older citizens. Uh, this is an ongoing, we've been doing this for the last couple of years. Basically, this, and this is a little bit different that it says uh, for all fiscal years beginning July 1st, and essentially this can be ongoing, so we don't have to vote this article every single year. Are there any questions on this article? Well, swallow it. Okay. Mr. Moderator, uh, Russ Greve, 24 Nicholas Road. Uh, what is the tax uh, effect of this? It's going to be an ongoing uh, year to year, I understand. So is this like a 10,000, 20,000, 40,000? What is it? And there's a number of, the rest of these four, five, six, seven, and eight, all have seemed to me have effects on the taxes. And my, my question is, some of this has to be offset, doesn't it? Doesn't a lot of this stuff have to be offset to the rest of the taxpayers as opposed to what's given to uh, veterans or any of the others? Mr. Manning? I'll defer the answer to that to our CFO, Tim O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sir, uh, there's no impact, no additional impact this year this keeps in place the exemptions that were in place last year. The exemption amount is a modest amount, for example, for a blind homeowner. I understand that. I meant in collective. Okay, if there was 100 or 200 people who qualify for these and they each get $1,000. Sure, let me tell you exactly what it is. We have 70 people who qualify and the total exemption in 2019 was 79000 $992.81, and it will be unimpacted by this motion for the next year. If you vote no, that amount would drop by three sevenths to thirty-seven thousand four hundred nine dollars. Thank you. And will we'll, you have figures for all the other? Yes, sir. Because some of these are going to be new, aren't they? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, Nancy Stevenson, 18 Hayden Row. I just wanted to clear, have you clarify. You said an increase, but you meant a decrease. Is that correct? Go ahead. Mr. Moderator, the, the, I think the easiest way to understand it is that it's uh, a base exemption and an additional 0.75 exemptions. Those are reductions in people's taxes for the people who apply. So you're correct, it's a decrease for those people. And the former speaker was also correct. When the tax rates are set and the tax bills go out, this reduction results in every other property owner getting a very sm fractionally smaller uh, increase. So these people get a slight, uh, get a modest decrease, everyone else gets a slight increase. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Okay, if there are no other questions, then we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 4 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 5, the BRAVE Act. Board of Selectmen? Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning? Article 5, <clears throat> BRAVE Act. We move the motion as printed in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Uh, essentially, this is an abatement. Uh, for seniors, and 
This is a tax law that increases to limited property tax exemptions that are available to seniors, surviving spouses, and minor children with deceased parents, with the exemptions having a limit on the assets of the taxpayer. Any questions on this article? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 6, Brave Act continued. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen re <laughs> recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 6, the Brave Act. <laughs> Uh, we move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is real estate exemption for veterans and other qualified persons uh, where their home is owned by a trust, conservator, or fiduciary for the person's benefit. And this provides limited exemptions for disabled veterans, Purple Heart recipients, and the surviving spouses of parents of service members killed in combat. To get exemptions, the property has to be titled in the taxpayer's name. The article would allow these homeowners to get the exemption if they titled their home in a trust as some people do. Any questions on this article? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 7, Brave Act continued again. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 7, the Brave Act, we move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, uh, there is a current limited exemption for the parents of survivor service members killed in combat. This provision would create a complete exemption from real estate property tax for those parents. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous and so voted. Article 8, Brave Act, once again. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 8, Brave Act. We move the uh, motion as printed the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, essentially, this creates a program similar to the Senior Volunteer Service Tax Credit Program. Any discussion? And again, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 9, set the salary of elected officials. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Mr. Manning. The Appropriation Committee rec recommends approval. And can we get a little explanation of to whom this applies? Uh, this is the town clerk, town clerk only. Um, this motion is the Board of Selectmen. And the Board of Selectmen uh, recommends the motion as written in the motions and articles document. Okay. Any questions? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. And now we will slow down a little bit. Fiscal 2020 operating budget. Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Mr. Manning, on the town side. We've moved, we move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and in the warrant articles and motions document. Okay, good evening. My name is Michael Manning and I am chairman of the Appropriation Committee. The Appropriations Committee is pleased to present the 2020 budget. Here are the budget highlights. The Appropriation Committee recommends approval of a budget with $90 million in general fund spending, plus 6.2 million in enterprise and CPC spending. The challenge with this year's budget was not only to meet the needs of a growing community, but to limit the overall tax impact to the community. Going into the budget season, the Board of Selectmen and Town Manager communicated the desire to sustain services and implement growth-targeted increases in education, public safety, 
Veterans and Human Services, and other town hall operations. This budget successfully achieves this request with additional resources to schools, police, fire, health, and other departments while holding the tax impact to residents at 2.5%. Next slide. The fiscal year budget process. This budget presented to you tonight was achieved through collaborative efforts between the Board of Selectmen, School Committee, Town Manager, and Town Departments. The goal was not only to meet the needs of a growing community, but to be fiscally responsible and consider the long-term financial health of the community. Forecasts over the next few years indicate that budgets will continue to be tight as school enrollments are predicted to increase, increase while revenue from new growth decreases. These forecasts, forecasts based on data available today and can shift due to significant unforeseen costs or revenues that could alter these projections. Next slide. Proposed operating budget. Here's the proposed operating budget. The town operating budget is $92,698,223, up 4.29%, and general fund operating budget plus appropriation articles is $90,017,232, up 5.7%. The notable increases include the school budget with a 2.99 million increase, or 6.63% increase, which reflects the rapid growth in, stu in student enrollment. General government increased 12%. The increase is largely due to the addition of, human, of a human resources benefits administrator, finance department reorganization, increase in legal expenses, and a need, needed increase in the town's compensation reserve. The public safety budget is up 4.91% with one new police sergeant position and three new fighter, firefighter positions. <coughs> The Health and Human Services budget is up 19%. A Board of Health nurse position has been added, as well as increased funding for veteran services staffing to meet a growing demand for support. Employee benefits and insurance is up 7.55%, primarily due to increases in health insurance premiums and Middlesex County retirement plan costs. Regional Technical Vocational School budget is up 36% due to increased enrollment. On the positive side, debt service is down $1 million. Last year, we had a large increase in debt service due to the completion of the DPW at Marathon School. The drop will continue in future years, notwithstanding the approval of major new capital projects. Sewer enterprise budget is down 10.7% due to lower debt service costs and retirement of debt. Next slide. The major takeaway from this slide is that the debt service is 9.7% of the general fund, bu fund budget. Last year, debt service was 11.4%. The school department has the largest proportion of the budget, accounting for 55.1% of the, school, the total budget. Employee benefits and insurance is 13.2%. Reserve and trust fund highly, highlights. This year's budget sets aside $400,000 for OPEB or other post-employment benefits. This is about half the 851,000 figure specified in the OPEB actuarial valuation report. By not funding per the actuarial report, we are not on track to eliminate the town's unfunded $28 million liability, and we continue to kick the can down the road to our future Hopkins taxpayers. But because of the tight budget, our OPEB contribution will be underfunded this year. We are also allocating 208,000 to the town's rainy day fund or stabilization account. The town's finance handbook recommends having a stabilization fund containing 5% of the town's annual operational budget. We currently have 3.43 million in the stabilization count. If this year's stabilization allocation is approved tonight, the stabilization fund will be 4.4% of the annual operational budget. This new total is slightly under recommended guidelines. Our state capital stabilization fund has 320,000 and the OPUB trust fund has 2.45 million. Capital articles. Appropriation Committee recommends for this year's articles are based on face-to-face -face meetings with department heads and article sponsors along with a sound and responsible financial planning. There are nine proposed borrowing articles. All but two of the borrowing articles will be made inside of the levy limit. Proposed borrowings that will be debt exclusions include the fire department ladder truck and the proposed municipal parking. These two items will require an additional vote and approval on the ballot with voting to be held on May 20th. 
Other capital articles, including pay-as-you-go capital expenses, using $1,358,121 from free cash. <coughs> Such capital items include scheduled replacement of DPW trucks, police cruisers, and district-wide facility improvements. The Appropriation Committee continues to monitor the town's debt levels, taking into account the ability to pay for these projects. Total general fund debt for fiscal year 2020 is 7.9% of the total general fund expenditures. Next slide. Current and projected debt service. This slide shows the current and projected debt service. Each bar shows the actual general fund debt plus impact for debt articles in the fiscal year 20 budget. You can see the impact to debt service due to the library, DPW, and marathon school projects from fiscal year 17 through 19. With the initial borrowing of these projects behind us, the debt service tails off in future years. The debt service for the high school ends in 2022. However, the MSBA reimbursement for the high school will also end in 2022. Since the reimbursement is nearly identical to the debt service in these last two years of payment, the chart has been modified to present net of the MSBA reimbursement. This is why the decrease is gradual. It is a true representation of the decrease in debt service over time. Next. The next graph is similar to the previous debt service chart, but shows forecasted debt going out to 2045. There will be increased debt drop-off starting in 2025 through 2035. Tax impact. For the average single family home valued at $599,000, the projected tax levy for fiscal year 2020 will be $260 or a 2.5% increase over last year's tax. The total change in tax levy is $3,708,457 or 5.4%. Subtract the estimated $2 million new growth and the levy to existing taxpayers is $1,708,457, or 2.5%. It is important to understand that this is the average increase. Based on the change in assessed value of your home, the actual increase could be greater or less than 2.5%. Next slide. Excess levy. The next slide shows Hopkinton's excess or unused levy capacity. People often ask how much of a tax levy the town can send to taxpayers without an operational override. Here's how it is calculated. The unused capacity from fiscal year 2019 is used as the base for calculating the 2020 excess capacity. For 2020, from the 19, $1,952,285 base, we add allowable levy for Prop 2.5%. Prop two and a half. This year's new growth is estimated to be $2 million. New growth estimates are lower this year due to the lower construction estimates at Legacy Farms. Back in, in fiscal year 2018, new growth was $2.7 million. Last year it was $2.2 million. This year's $2 million projection shows the decreasing trend regarding new growth. We can also add additional debt service that was excluded debt. In this budget, excluded debt is $673,212 lower than last year, so it is subtracted in the calculation. For the 2020 budget, our new allowable tax levy increases $4,889,023. When you subtract the $3.7 million levy increase from the 2020 budget, you get the new excess levy capacity of, of about $1.18 million for next year's budget. Finally, I would like to mention that the Appropriation Committee has generated another comprehensive report this year. It is available online or there's a handout out in the auditorium hallway. <clears throat> this report gives details for each department's budget, including the main drivers for requested increases. I hope everyone here has seen it or references it as we go through the financial articles. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Would the school committee like to make its presentation at this time? While the school committee is preparing, uh, it appears that there are some registered voters on stage right in the front in the area that's reserved for town employees. If, if you're a, a registered voter, 
in town meeting, you should move to a part of the hall where registered voters are supposed to be. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Carol Cavanaugh. I'm the superintendent of the Hopkinton Public Schools, and with me tonight is Mrs. Susan Rothermick, who is the finance director, and we are very pleased to present the Hopkinton Public Schools FY20 budget. And we want to thank the Appropriation Committee, as well as the Board of Selectmen, for their ongoing support in our budget creation this year. So in terms of creating our budget, uh, our, our major goals were to maintain Hopkinton's exceptional academic and extracurricular programs, to offer curriculum and instruction that meets the needs of all learners, to add teachers and support staff to accommodate the increases in student population, and we will address that in this presentation, to ensure that our school facilities support maximal growth for all children, to support student safety measures, to continue to build our technology programming, and to support the principal's school improvement plans. Hopkinton, as you know, has maintained very high status across the Commonwealth. This year, U.S. News and World Report has ranked Hopkinton uh, sixth, Hopkinton High School. So we had some challenges along the way. Once we got going, we realized that the increases in enrollment were going to um, require a whole lot more funding for us for next year, and most of that funding you'll see in these slides comes in the way of personnel. We have uh, our out-of-district transportation for special education students is done through the Accept Collaborative. One of the big budget movers in Accept backed out of Accept for this year, so we had an unanticipated cost of $200,000. We have growing transportation needs because we have growing numbers of students. We still need to create programs as they are deemed necessary. And we opened the Marathon Elementary School. So you know that when you have a lot more square footage to clean and a lot more snow to move, the costs go up. And of course, there are always unfunded mandates. So what you see on the slide behind you is really information that came from FY19. And we felt it was really important for you to be able to see what's happening in FY20 as it's contextualized in FY19. So in FY19, we had a lot of unanticipated personnel needs, and that came about because of increased enrollment. You can see that we had to add 20.3 <coughs> positions and that resulted in an increase of $678,528. That was unbudgeted in FY19. So people are probably wondering why we didn't anticipate that number of students. We had estimated about 50 students would enter the Hopkinton Public Schools in FY19, which is fairly typical for us. Once we got into October, we realized that we didn't have just 50 new students, but across 13 grade levels and out-of-district placements and students who were attending vocational programs, we actually had 189 new students. So that was 139 more kids than we anticipated. If we break them into chunks of 20, you'll see we have about seven groups of 20. Each groups of, group of 20 is about the same as 1.4 FTEs. So we need to hire 1.4 teachers every time we have 20 additional students in our schools. 1.4 is about the number because kids don't just have a ninth grade teacher or a second grade teacher. They have PE teachers, art teachers, special education teachers, English language learner teachers, OT, PT, and all of those um, different support services and specialists. So when we built the FY20 budget, we built it on that number you see at the bottom <clears throat> of the screen, which is 103 students. How do we make those determinations? If you take a look at the following slide, you can see that we made, uh, we analyzed our student enrollment data on October 4th, on December 20th and on April 17th, so just very recently. And you can see how those numbers have increased. 
So if you're taking a look at the 103 anticipated students, 37 of the 103 are already enrolled in our classrooms. That means they are sitting in front of teachers who are teaching them across the district currently. We have an online enrollment system and so parents can go in there and indicate that they plan to enroll their students for next year. At this point in time, I think that uh, my slide, it tells you that we already have 32 kids who are um, not captured in this, this number. Uh, that number is actually up to 39 at, as of this point. It was uh, different on April 25th when we put these slides together. So we felt on April 25th that we had about 34 spaces left in those 103. Currently, we have 27 spaces left. And last year, we had over 100 students join our schools in the summertime. So we feel like enrollment is something that's impacting our budget. And we are uncertain whether or not we will be in front of town meeting again looking for additional money uh, before the close of the FY20 budget. You can see how those students are distributed. When we look at those numbers, that slide tells you that right now we have 217 students enrolled in kindergarten. It's 220. Last year, we estimated we would have 204 students enrolled in kindergarten. We had 264 students enrolled in kindergarten. What we're seeing are trends where kids are here for the K-12 experience, so heavy volume in kindergarten. We see a lot of enrollment in grade six, so maybe some people are just looking for the secondary experience, and then there are some folks who are just looking for the high school experience, so we had increased enrollment in grades eight and nine combined. So to indicate to you how we get these numbers, the number 103 came from NESDEC projections. They've been doing projections for our public schools for years. <coughs> what you see on the slide uh, behind me uh, are all of the houses that are going to be prepared for occupancy by June of 2019. That's what's in that middle column. And you may have difficulty reading that from so far away. But I use this slide to illustrate that we are constantly thinking about enrollment projections. If each of those 132 homes has, on average, only one student, we will have 132 new kids in the Hopkinton Public Schools next year. So let's talk a little bit about the way we built our budget. We start with a zero-based budget, which means that we have nothing on the table and we ask the building principals and the directors of technology curriculum to come and tell us what they predict they are going to need based on enrollment and based on programming in the Hopkinton Public Schools. When they first came to us this year, they came with a 9.9% request increase over the FY19 budget. Our budget guidance from the Board of Selectmen was at 6.5, and we tried very hard to stay within those parameters. Uh, we felt like 6.5 was a very generous offering on the part of the Board of Selectmen, and it recognized our increased enrollment. And still, it is difficult to keep our schools going when we have so many new students arriving all of the time. What you can see on that slide are some of the positions that, we, that were requested and that we eliminated in those incipient stages of budget creation, which was able to get us down to 6.3% increase, and which was approved by the Board of Selectmen and the Appropriation Committee. And so the, this slide here, we typically put in there, because it shows you your per pupil expenditure, these are the FY, or the 2017 per pupil expenditures. Um, the 2018 per pupil expenditures are not yet available. Those other communities were chosen just because they are ones with whom we sometimes compete. They are ones that are similar to us in size and demography. Um, and you can take a look that we are ranked 24th in terms of per pupil expenditure. $14,557 per pupil is actually a very conservative per pupil expenditure in Massachusetts. And so the point of this slide is to say that Hopkinton school children get a whole lot, I think, uh, on, on a very conservative per pupil expenditure. Some other very quick highlights in the way the Hopkinton public schools are performing. 
if you take a look at this, these are MCAS rankings, um, and these are for grades three to eight. It's sort of difficult to have a lot of metrics on other grade levels. Grades three and five in ELA and grades six, seven, eight in math are performing in the top 5% in the state. So anything with that green color is 95th or better. White is in the 90th to 94th percentile. And anything that's in peach um, is in the 80th to 89th percentile. And those are places where in the budget creation we did actually apply funds to sort of raise those stores, the scores and build those programs. Hopkinton High School, um, I'll just read through these very quickly. Uh, the high school is ranked 18th statewide in average reading and math SAT scores. 89% of Hopkinton High School students earned a passing score, either a 3, 4, or 5, on over 1,100 advanced placement tests taken. The high school had 100% of its students earn proficient or advanced on the ELA MCAS in 2018. Not one student ranked e needs improvement or failing on that exam. 97% of its students are in proficient or adva advanced in mathematics in 2018. Hopkinton High School was one of four high schools in Massachusetts named by the Commissioner of Education as a school of recognition. And Boston Magazine ranks Hopkinton High School in the top 20% among the best public school districts in Massachusetts in 2017. So Hopkinton Public Schools have an awful lot to celebrate and I thank you as town uh, meeting attendees and voters tonight for supporting our budget. And now I'll have Mrs. Rothmick talk a little bit about the budget itself. Thank you. So as you can see um, from this slide, as we said, we um, brought the budget in at 6.63, which was a little bit over um, the 6.5 guidance. I apologize if I'm not talking close enough. Um, This slide really just shows that in a school district, basically, we are a service industry. So 80% of our budget is personnel. So whenever we are building our budget and we need to either um, address student need or actually make reductions, it typically comes in the line of personnel. Um, our expenses are tied to contracts, uh, utilities, and there's much less movement in that line item. So as you can see, the personnel increases that we added in fiscal 19 to address that additional um, student enrollment, these are personnel that are also then carried over into the FY20 operating budget. The new request, the new requests for FY20 um, to address not only ones that we could not address in terms of enrollment, but also that additional um, increase in personnel or uh, student enrollment. These are the personnel increases that were requested for FY20. And when we're looking at a budget, we're always looking for the buildings to be creative. So if you have a need, then we're also going to ask for you to look at the, the best um, configuration and also suggest some reductions. So these are some of the reductions that were made knowing that we need to keep in line with our finite revenues that the town has. This next slide just really puts those last slides, um, different visual to kind of sum up everything that has happened both in 19 and 20 that is carried on into the FY20 budget. And then the last slide looks at those expense changes. As I said, most of our changes are in personnel. You can see that most of these changes in expenses are um, much lower. Central office, what you have there is a contractual in increase for the bus contract and the addition of another bus. Um, basically really with drive, or enrollment is driving that. Curriculum, there are new curriculum um, textbooks for a, a new curriculum for uh, civics. Athletics and regular education, you can see our, our minor. Building and grounds and utilities, those are utilities uh, for the new building. Also, we received a one-time 
rebate for our utilities in FY19, and we actually shifted that cost to cover some of the personnel that we had to hire in 2019 this year. Occupational day, that's really enrollment driven. And special education, this is another place where we took um, prepaid transportation and shifted that also to cover personnel that were um, needed to be hired in FY19. So this is really, that's half of that increase. Um, so you can see those are the increases for the expenses. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. $92.7 million. Somebody must have a question. <laughs> Hello. I'm concerned about the uh, price name, of name, oh, William name and address. Simpson. Five. Constitution Court. Thank, thank you. Um, price of items like pickup trucks at $100,000 and buy a trucks at a million and a half. I know this isn't quite the same subject, but it seems to me that hook and ladder truck. Uh, we're not. We're not on that article yet. Oh, that that comes up later in the meeting. It will. Yes. Well, I'm going to talk about that. When it, okay. <laughs> uh, Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. Uh, I had a question for the school administrators. So uh, if we're using, I can't remember the acronym, the NESDEC uh, guidance for future enrollment, can you, can you give an indication as to the accuracy of their historical uh, projections? Uh, <laughs> And, and, and so the reason I ask, obviously, the performance of the schools is, is obviously very good. It's one of the reasons my wife and I moved here. Our kids aren't quite in the school yet, but they will be soon. Um, they missed by 3x, not like 10%, 20%. So I, I'd be curious to know if you could speak to the accuracy of their historical projections. And I'd like to understand what we may be doing differently in the future to make sure we don't miss by 3x. Uh, NESDEC stands for New, Engl uh, New England School Development Council, and they do this work pretty largely across the Commonwealth. Um, I would say that historically um, they have not been entirely accurate, but I would say that last year when we had the 50 going to 189 students, they were so far off that I don't think that they've ever been that far off historically, and they were rather apologetic about it. So when they put together our predictions for next year, they uh, offered to do a far more in-depth uh, project for us, and that's where they came up with the 103 students. But as a school department, we wanted to make sure that we were accurately uh, or getting the best numbers that we could. I mean, obviously, it is not a science. It's impossible to know how many kids and how many families will move into the district. Between September and February, so between September 2018 and February 2019, uh, we had probably 100 houses that passed papers, 50 of them were new construction, 50 of them were homes where a family moved out and a new family with children moved in. So we have information that comes to us from the welcome wagon person, we have some information that comes to us from the planning board, and we take all of that data and just put it all together and try to make the best predictions that we can. I think that number 132 that you saw on that slide is probably the best data that we have right now. But again, I will tell you, this is all guesstimate, um, educated guesstimates. But thank you for asking that question. Uh, thanks for the response. Can I get one more question? A quick follow-up? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I guess it's a town meeting. I'm not calling out action items. But is there a way to see historical projections? I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that this is a pretty big, it's a pretty difficult thing to forecast. Um, but when I, hear, when I hear guesstimate, it still doesn't instill confidence. If you, if you want to send an email to the central office, we can get you historical data from the last decade of NESDEC project, project, projections, if that's helpful. Yeah, just the accuracy of what their I forecast see. was versus what the actual 
was. Absolutely, we could get that for you, surely. I'm sure everybody here would like to see that too, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jim Monahan, 305 West Main Street. This has to do with the, uh, the town budget. And I noticed the uh, benefits went up over 7%, which is, uh, from my experience, just from business, exceptionally large. And I know this followed up last year, I recall looking at the salary increases, they were pretty significant. So I, I'd like a uh, little bit of understanding as why, why the <coughs> benefits are going up uh, at such a large percentage. Mr. Manning? I can, I can defer that to the CFO, but pretty much the health insurance went up quite a bit, but you can elaborate. Okay, so uh, I'm looking at the town manager here, and uh, the salaries are separate from the benefits, so that's not a salary increase in the benefits section. No, I understand. So the benefit would be comprised of our contributions to our pension plan, and the payment for retirees for health care, and... Uh, health insurance for, for the workforce. And so health insurance has been a challenge. And I, I don't have more detail than that right now. Uh, can, so can, you, can you clarify for the moderator's benefit, does that also take into account growth in the, in the covered population within town? In other words, is it, is it reflective of the increase in the number of school department employees and other employees within the town? So all the employees would be in there and all the retirees that are uh, non-school retirees for health care and uh, the school retirees as well for health care would be in there. Are, th are these contractually, uh, contractual issues that we're bound by these numbers or are these, I mean, because businesses have to deal with this all the time. If your health insurance goes up 7%, then I know I'm going to be bearing probably about 7% more. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to understand why it went up 7%. I think we all understand that health benefits, ex health costs go up, but it's just unusual that they seem to be borne by the town, and, and it should be a little more equally distributed between the towns and those who receive the benefits. If I may, um through the town moderator, as well as on behalf of town staff, I want to say good evening. Um, it's, it's an honor to serve this community. Uh, it's even more exciting to have the front row seat working with the very capable volunteer teams uh, facilitating some of these discussions at town meeting. Specific to your question, general insurance went up because of the new buildings that we have brought online. Health insurance, at the time we were putting the budget together, health insurance was projected to go up by 6.7%. I can assure you that based on our current negotiations, that number will come in lower than 6.7%. And that's the money that may eventually either uh, flow back to free cash or be used to fund other expenses at town hall. So your question is spot on. Um, again, in summary, general insurance went up because of new buildings. Mm -hmm. Health insurance is 6.7. I think if you look at the market based on what we received, generally the providers were looking at uh, their increases at 8%. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street. Um, through the moderator, I also have a question for the school administration. Um, and it, recognize that, that most of the budget is related to personnel, and, and I know how impacted it is by school enrollment figures, but I have a question about a, 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 another part of the budget. Um, we've invested a lot in the last 20 years in, our, in, our, in the schools, and I'm curious if you can provide any additional detail on um, maintenance budgets, uh, what's being done to maintain our schools, and what's, you know, in, in, in general, just how are we ensuring that they're going to serve us well for the next, uh, for the next 50 years? Sure. I'll ask Mrs. Rodmick to come up because she oversees building and grounds. Um, so I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the total maintenance budget is, but I can tell you that we have a very robust preventive maintenance program in place. Um, every asset has been loaded into a work order system. Every asset has a preventive maintenance schedule. 
um, detailing exactly what will be done and um, when it will be done. Tickets pop up so we know um, exactly how much is being done from a preventive maintenance, but also from a repair standpoint. So we can keep track and that's how we build our capital plan and so that we're not putting more good money after something that really should just be replaced. Is that helpful? Yeah, um, if I could just ask a follow-up question. Do you have any details on how our maintenance budget has increased or decreased via versus prior years? I would say that it is increasing. One thing is bringing online um, the marathon building. Now, one of the things that we did not have to do through the building project, we were able to launch that building, get that up and running, supplies and everything else. And the first year, um, the, all the commissioning and the preventive maintenance was done as part of the project. Going forward now, everything will be scheduled to be part of our own staff. So what you're seeing is um, we've been increasing um, last year and this year, adding staff to the maintenance budget um, so that they can be uh, addressing all of the needs within the buildings. So you will continue to see staffing needs to keep up with all this equipment. Thank you. Sure. On my right, Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road, member of the planning board, but speaking as a private citizen. Two questions. Uh, I think one is either the board of selectmen or the um, committee here. Uh, the $92 million budget, can you explain, is it any part of it uh, involving an override or is it all within the bounds of uh, Proposition 2.5? Mr. Manning. Uh, yes, this year's budget is all within the Prop 2.5. There is no override needed. Thank you. That, that's a wonderful thing. Um, my second question is to our school administration. Uh, earlier on tonight, you mentioned that you were including numbers uh, for the Keefe Tech students going to vocational school. Uh, they're a separate budget. I know that we're binding everything together. I don't see how that affects your budget. And I'm a no. former member of the school committee for Keep Tax, so that's why I'm asking. Yes, it does not. Uh, we do pay for Norfolk Aggie. Yeah, we pay for Norfolk Aggie. Uh, this year we had 20 students who were at Keefe Tech. Next year we will have 27 students at Keefe Tech. You probably noticed the number that comes um, out of uh, an outside budget, and that went up about $158,000 with those additional st seven students. But, but can you explain how that affects your budget? What yeah, the kids, who, the kids who attend Keefe Te Tech do not affect our budget per se. It just affects the town side budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. John Graziano, 8 Kimball Road. Um, I have, I think, what might be two questions through the moderator on the first one um, because I, it's a more of a procedural question. This article seems to do two very different things. Uh, the first one is dealing with the the operating budget, and the second one is a non-binding resolution to support a, um, a upcoming ballot question. And I'm curious if I don't know if this is town for town council what, or the town manager. Why is this in one article when it seems to be two very distinct actions? I mean, is there any practical effect to the non-binding resolution? There is no practical effect to the non-binding resolution language. <laughs> well, then I question why we're voting on it if there's no practical application to it. But, well, why not? Um, <laughs> it the, will have no effect. The whatsoever. second question, since it's on there and there's no practical application, but I do know there's a ballot question for um, either appropriations or the Board of Selectmen, um, I noticed that the untaxed levy is going down from FY19 to the FY20 budget. So my question would be, is it, what's the wisdom of an underride when that's what we're a, hearing about is? That's a separate article. We'll, we'll take that up under, under it's, the. It's in this article. It's, it's right there. That was my first question. Oh, give me one second. Oh, okay. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Originally it had been planned as a separate article. So th this, uh, at this stage, this is bundled as uh, both combination of a vote on the 92.7 million mm -hmm. article as well as the underwrite. So, 
So, I mean, I, I, the, the answer I got on the first question was because the second one doesn't do anything, but presumably we're all going to at least take a binding vote at the ballot. So my yeah. question is, given the fact that the untaxed levy is going down from FY19 to FY20, and we're hearing in all the presentations about the increased need for services with the schools, with public safety, and additionally, we're up to the 2.5% limit this year. W what would be the wisdom of an underride right now when it seems to potentially handcuff the town in future years if we have unexpected increases? Um, two things. One, can, can we put up the slide that had the, uh, the uh, excess levy demonstration? And then who would like to tackle the question? Uh, Mr. Manning or, or uh, Mr. Kamalo? Or Ms. Wright? or someone else. <laughs> Not that this I'll, is a difficult question. Yes. I will try. <laughs> um, let, let me explain at least my understanding of why this article is included in the budget. Twofold. From my discussions with the selectmen, transparency is key. Whilst this is not a practical issue, I think the feeling is that we will always give town meeting the opportunity to discuss budget mat related matters. So it's for transparency. And then number two, because the amount of the underwrite is tied to the excess levy, which is discussed in the budget, it is therefore appropriate to discuss this item alongside the budget. Then specific to your question, <clears throat> looking forward, Based on the information we know and are aware of currently, we did not, at least from our viewpoint, identify any risk to the town going forward. If you look at the history of the underwrite in this town, this is the third time the town is considering an underwrite. Because of the new growth, because of the free cash that was certifying through the diligence and good management of the budgets by different town departments, and also because of our conservative approach to developing the budget, as well as the generosity of the community in funding the rainy day fund, we believe, at least from my perspective, I believe that there is no risk opposed to the town going forward. Sir, can I ask a clarification? I have been up here for a while, but it'll be quick, I think. Please, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned the connection between the underwrite and the operating budget, but I want to make sure everybody's clear here because I think these pieces of municipal finance get a little tricky. <clears throat> the, well, the vote tonight on the underwrite has no effect, but the vote we're going to take at the ballot, there is no impact whatsoever to the operating budget for FY20, whether the underride passes or fails? Because you mentioned there was a connection between the two, but they, practically speaking, have nothing to do with each other operationally. Practically, yes, but in term, through the moderator, practically, yes. However, the calculation of the two numbers right. is related. But we can pass the budget tonight. If the underride fails at the ballot, it doesn't have any impact. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. So just uh, I, I one, would, one additional point through, go ahead. through the moderator is the effect will be felt in the 2021 budget. And potentially beyond. And beyond when the ceiling is higher. Mm -hmm. Right. But no impact on anyone's tax bill one way or the other in 2020 and no impact on the 2020 budget. H historically, just uh, as, as an historical point, the underrides <clears throat> that have been passed in prior years have been presented as separate articles. And so they, they have stood separate from the, uh, the, the appropriation or budget article that we're looking at now. And it could still be separated with an appropriate motion from someone on the floor. On my right. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. This is uh, directed towards the uh, school administration. Uh, having stood up here uh, to ask questions that are never answered but, uh, in previous years when uh, this presentation was done. I just want to acknowledge that I thought that was one of the best I've ever seen. I appreciated the transparency and the clarity. And so my only comment or question, if I follow the rules here, is can you keep that up in the future? Thank you.
on my left. Anne Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, this is a question actually to both um, Mr. Manning and to the school administration or these items I'm trying to clarify in my own mind. Um, Mr. Manning, you were talking about new growth and the, you know, the uh, projected new growth and um, it was going down this year and it's projected to go down every year until 2023 according to the handout that we, we received. Um, if new growth is going down, how, is, how does that inform the school budget? I guess I'm wondering if do these two items talk to each other or are they totally separate? I understood you to say that new growth had something to do with the amount of building that was being done in town. Mr. Manning. So when we calculate what our budget is, uh, we take, we essentially can take our overall budget, the increase, we subtract the new growth and it, you know, the other parts of the calculation, right. but it gives you, here's what the tax levy is on the taxpayers. So as an example, if the overall town increases 5% and that new growth represents 2.5% or 3%, make it 3%, then the tax levy is 2%. So it's really, okay. if, our, if our new growth is decreasing, then it's gonna, and the schools are still growing, that could be a structural problem, being that now that it's gonna have to be through a tax levy or other sources of funding. It just gets a little more challenging. So that's why I'm trying to, I was trying to paint the picture about new growth going down. Right now we've been very, I can say we've been fortunate with the new growth that it allows us to adjust to the growth in the schools or other, you know, in the past few years it's been, it helped us uh, adapt to the, the Marathon School, the other schools, uh, when we were to fund those and still maintain two and a half, three percent. Those were pretty large projects and it was really absorbed by all that new growth we had. Right. So now we're gonna, it's gonna be, as we are moving forward, it'll just be, it'll be more of a challenge um, unless we, you know, it, I guess we, I don't know if we, it's not up to me to say, do we control the new growth, but these are just the trends based on, you know, the build out of Legacy Farms and the other projects that are, I wouldn't say it's winding down, but there is, there is a trend that okay. these big projects are going down. Through you, Mr. Moderator, I just, I, I have a, a follow-up comment, I guess, it's, or a comment or a question, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's actually a lot of plans for a lot of growth in the town. Um, maybe not anything on the scale of legacy farms, but things like, you know, 32 homes, between Whale and Chamberlain, um, you know, uh, condos all over Main Street. Um, I, I just don't get how we can be projecting that new growth is going to go down. Then we heard from the school committee. It, yeah, it's still growth. It is. It's growth. And, and then we're hearing from the school board and, uh, that, in fact, they're projecting you know, possibly 130 new students for next year. Um, I, I, these things don't seem to equate to me. And I guess I don't know whether I'm the only one that's confused by this or um, I'm just was hoping someone might be able to explain that, explain the difference between the two. Yeah. Norman? If through the moderator, if I may, after the developments at Legacy Farms are complete, new growth will go down. Okay. Yes. Because we, we don't have another Legacy Farms where we are getting a very high number of units per year. So well, currently, if we have 20 new permits per year, we are adding those 20 new permits to about 50 or 60 permits from Legacy Farms. After Legacy Farms is done, we'll only be getting the 32, the 20, without the 50 or 60 coming from Legacy Farms. Okay. All right. Thank On you. my right. Connie Wright, 25 Amherst Road. So please bear with me. I want to see if we can pull up three slides. One is either the second or third slide that discussed, for lack of better words, the potential underfunding of, of pension or 
uh, post-retirement. I don't know if you can find it. Well, go ahead with your question while they're trying well, to get the slide. Because I need that. Um, this is okay. in the general um, presentation. Right. It was the one right before, I think. It was the one before with the pie chart. But the whole discussion is that we mentioned and recommended that we weren't funding something fully, mostly, if I recall, post-retirement benefits. Am I correct? Yes. OK. So we haven't funded them completely. Then we have the underwrite slide, which we just had up there, which had a suggestion. Um, and then we had what the school presented was um, the fact that we've had over uh, additional students causing an impact. And when I put those three slides together, my question is, if we propose this underwrite, what does it do to our rainy day fund? Because I think we have nothing left and we have nothing, we are underfunding a pension plan. We have no capacity to deal with growth. And I'm all for lower taxes, but then we have an impact in subsequent years, which we heard we might get relief in 2020, but then we get an impact in 2021. So what does the underwrite do to our quote unquote rainy day fund? Uh, through the moderator. Go ahead, Mr. McMullo. The underwrite, if it passes, has no effect on the rainy day fund. So we do not touch the rainy day fund. The rainy day fund stays at a million point nine? No. What's our rainy day fund number? It's four, four point. It's four point three million dollars. Four point three million dollars, so less than ten percent of our budget. Correct. Our target is 5%. So it doesn't add to, but you're saying it has a zero impact on our rainy day fund. Correct. Okay. On my left. Hi. Um, Hari Chalapali, 51 Greenwood Road. My question's for the school committee. Um, you outlined uh, clearly you know, why there was an increase in the school budget, mainly attributable to the increase in personnel, which in turn is attributed to the increase in enrollment. My question relates to where we are with physical capacity of the different schools. Um, as my kindergartner grows up and comes through these school systems, uh, is there a concern looming on the horizon in terms of <coughs> physical capacity that we need to be worried about? There is, and thank you for that question. Uh, as you know, we've just built the Marathon Elementary School. At this point, we have filled those classrooms, um, but we are feeling very comfortable that that building is able to accommodate the students who are entering into pre-K, K and 1. On April 12th, we had uh, a deadline to submit a statement of interest to the Mass School Building Authority to do a renovation and construction project over at the Elmwood School. Uh, right now, Elmwood is sort of nearing capacity. If we needed additional spaces for our two and three classrooms, we would need to probably dismantle you know, a health room and put health on a cart, dismantle an art room and put art on a cart. Um, so what we are trying to do is prevent that. Uh, right now, Hopkins is in need of, probably in need of classrooms in the next couple of years. Most of those classrooms, they are full. Again, we would be looking at a model where art gets on a cart, right? In the back of the Hopkins school, in the original designs, there are places where you could, in fact, put portable classrooms. Um, the middle school, right now we have a tech the Education Collaborative rent space from us here. There's also um, a meeting room in the front of the school. There is a, a principal's conference room. Those rooms could be transferred to classroom space if we needed to do that. Last Friday morning, we met with architects to take a look at the drawings for the high school. When the high school was built 20 years ago, there were uh, two wings on the back. and. Um, one of those wings was built out at only two-thirds, so there is a space there where you could put 
pretty readily, six additional classrooms, all the HVAC, all the plumbing, everything is there for that. So we're trying to get a price on additional classrooms for the high school. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you tonight that we need to do something with our physical plants to accommodate the um, increase in enrollment, absolutely. Um, and when we look at those numbers of 103 or 130 or whatever that is, if these kids come into our school and they are evenly distributed, so 10 students per grade level, we're going to be able to absorb that. If children come into our school so that we have 30 kids, for example, in grade six, we're not going to be able to absorb that and it's going to require more personnel and obviously more space to build out teams. Right. Thank you. Thank you. On my right, Shahid Manan, 274 Ash Street. Uh, I have a question for the town manager and team. Uh, I am part of the appropriations committee, but this is a question as a uh, private citizen. And my question is, uh, we looked at the OPEP fund uh, scenario where we see that our obligation is about 27 million and uh, we are funding um, half of what the actuaries are advising us, which is 800,000 and we are funding about 400,000. And if I remember the numbers correctly, at this rate, we are going to catch up in 2090. Uh, that is, if we are lucky. So the question is, what is our plan to handle it? I know Mr. Manning brought it up in the last year's budget discussion, as well as mentioned in his opening statement in this year's budget statement. And uh, I don't think we have had a clear understanding of what our strategy or approach is to handle it if um, the town manager team or the selectmen uh, can uh, uh, enlighten us on this, that would be, that'd be helpful. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, sir, for the question through the moderator. Go ahead. Um, the, we faced a similar situation several years ago before I was in town with the pension liability and there was a mandate and we got onto a glide path to fund, fully fund the pension liability by 2036 and we're on track to do that. Uh, shortly after that, the idea of the OPEB liability came up and there is no statutory or regulatory requirement to fund it at all, just to report it at this point. So on one level, we are very forward looking in doing anything. Many communities are not doing anything, and we're doing something. Uh, and what we're doing is funding at a, a, about half of the level, uh, you pointed out, of what the actuary recommended. So the actuary recommended paths to fund uh, it at a level that would have it fully funded by 2047, and the path we're on is a long game, as you said, in the 2090s to get it fully funded. It's possible that at some point we'll face a mandate from the state regulator who will tell us we have to get onto that glide path, but until then we are taking half steps toward funding that liability. And uh, my understanding is it's in competition with other needs like teachers, a new police sergeant, uh, a public health nurse, and so there's a balancing process in which you're evaluating how much do you want to weight the needs for current services today and how much do you want to uh, pay down your future bills? And I would say this has been a middle path that we have taken. Anything else? Yes, and again, this is a good question. Um, at the moment, we're funding our OPEP liability through field cash. We're going to begin a discussion that will look at other ways of funding the plan that was put together for us by our consultant. Those options may include direct taxation or may also include borrowing. So again, thank you for a good question. We have ideas as to what the plan is as well as how we're going to fund the plan going forward. To the moderator, I have a follow-up question if I may. Go ahead. Um, so thank you for um, that response. I just want to point out we are one of the lowest um, in uh, all of the towns in Massachusetts, as you know. We are probably in the lowest quadrant in terms of OPEB funding. Just wanted to point out, I think, Tim, you know that. Uh, but a subsequent question I had since we touched the point of growth as well, 
And uh, on the budget, we made a point that our growth uh, related or new development related um, uh, new revenue is going to be about 2 million or 1.8 million and then a little bit lower. But even with that, it seems we are anticipating almost 200 new dwellings every year in the next three years. And that is reflected on our budget's revenue side forecasted. But are we also accounting that growth in all our services, reflecting how the cost is going to grow? And if we are able to handle that growth on the schools, on the DPW, on our uh, fire department, police, and all the services? Uh, sir, through the moderator, thank you for that question. Excellent question. I think probably the biggest planning priority the town has is to understand growth because we are on track for it to occur and the debate using the school uh, consulting group is whether we hit certain growth points in 2038 or 2028. It's really the tempo of the growth. So our top priority for planning should be on planning for growth. It's more important to understand how the costs respond to growth than it is to understand exactly when it's going to happen. So I think you heard the school department talk about the needs when you get beyond the few students and you have to start talking about adding janitors or librarians or more school resource officers. And uh, I would say that we, we do not have a complete answer on that now. Let's, but it, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to cut this off at this point. Let's, let's remember you. we're talking about the upcoming budget year. We're not talking about uh, years that are uh, beyond fiscal year 20. Thank you. So. I think that, that makes sense, but it is related because we are also talking about underwrite. But I'll, uh, I think, uh, stop here and let others okay. speak. Thank you. On my left. Hi, Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. Uh, regarding the third bullet up there, it says town financial management policies to achieve and maintain a balance of 5% of the general fund operating budget in the general stabilization fund. <laughs> and that's all right, I memorized it. <laughs> it will be approximately 4.4% if the proposed budget <clears throat> is adopted. So uh, the, regarding the town financial management policy, I'd like to ask three, Mr. Moderator, the Appropriation Committee, if they support that policy. Is that an appropriation committee policy in effect or a CFO driven? That's or? an interesting question. Is that a board of selectmen policy? Is that appropriations? Uh, town if, manager? If it helps another way to put it in the yeah. deliberations leading up to this, did the appropriation committee discuss the general stabilization, general stabilization fund and do they have an opinion on the current funding? So, so this is the town's financial management policy that was adopted by the town, and this represents uh, good guidelines. And we, we've never actually been at 5%, and I believe the stabilization fund, we've been trying to grow it for the past 11 years. We've been making good progress, um, but we're not quite there yet. But this is really the standard or, of where we want, would like to be. And, uh, but it's not, it's not hard in stone. It's just good financial policy. Okay. Uh, Follow-up question. If we could flip back to the wording of this article, the slide that was originally up there. It, uh, it talks about number two there, support a non-binding resolution. Did the Appropriation Committee take a vote on Article 10 and specifically on that Section 2, the non-binding resolution? Oh, do you mean the non-binding resolution or the, more specifically, the, the uh, inclusion of an underwrite. Well, given that we're talking about not using the full tax, <clears throat> you know, um, amount available, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a view on the appropriation committee opinion on, on this on this budget, and in particular on the non-binding resolution regarding the underwrite. Given that we've just heard a few examples where we're underfunding things, Mr. Manning. So the Appropriation Committee didn't take a discussion specifically on the underwrite. Um, in fact, we didn't, just like the moderator, we didn't even know it was bundled in this article until this, until this evening. So, um, but as we were discussing, as we saw it prior to, uh, to this evening's town meeting, we did discuss it a little bit that we're not gonna, we weren't going to vote against the operational budget because it's a non-binding. And uh, we also know that basically the town can support the underwrite, although we haven't we haven't discussed it, but uh, we don't think it has anything material 
uh, on this, this year's budget. So we didn't take a position specifically on the underwrite. Okay, thank you. And I'll just conclude with my opinion, I guess, is as we're going through this rapid period of growth and we see that growth will continue, but not at the rate that we've seen in the last couple of years. Uh, the demand for town services <clears throat> will follow that growth, and I'd like us to be in as strong as position as we can moving forward uh, from this year forward. Thank you. Mr. Moderator. On my right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mary Jo Andrikin to College Street. Given that the proposed underride will cause the town to lose 40% of its levy capacity, and given that the town has had many surprise expenses in the past year, and given that nobody is going to get a tax rebate as a result of any underride, I submit, Mr. Moderator, that the town should have a voice in whether this proposed underride is prudent. So therefore, I propose an amendment, or uh, uh, I propose that we vote separately on the, on the underride. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. <clears throat> so it's been proposed that the, the question of the underride within this article be voted on separately. So I'll entertain discussion on that motion at this point. Is there any further discussion? Is there any uh, continuing confusion as to the way this will operate? On my left. Mr. Moderator, Russell Shade, 7 Summer Street. Forgive me if I'm ignorant of some of this process. I'm fairly new to the whole uh, town meeting situation. I'm just curious to hear that the moderator and the Appropriations Committee were unclear that this was a part of this article until tonight. How, how does that happen? Are these articles not made available for review beforehand? I don't understand how both the moderator and the Appropriations Committee are sitting here saying, we're reading something at town meeting that we didn't know was a part of the article until we arrived here tonight. If, if, if either you or the Appropriations Committee could, could shed some light on that, I'd appreciate it. If, well, at this, um, if, if I may. At, at, yeah, at the risk of um, uh, kicking it to, to, uh, to the people that control the Warren articles, I'll turn to happen? Mr. Kamalo. Yes. To be clear, I understand the town moderator as well as the appropriations committee to be referring to the motions. They were not referring to the articles. You are correct. The motions were published yesterday. So the articles were not published until tonight? The moderator and the appropriations but committee didn't have the opportunity to you, review them? You know what? Let me, let me interrupt. I mean, that, that's really uh, ancillary to the discussion. The discussion at this point is on the, the motion that has been made. And to, I approve to, the motion. I, okay. So do you have comments on the, on the um, separate vote with respect to the underwrite proposal? No, sir. Okay. Then I'm going to move to the right. Questions on the budget. Please come to the microphone. I have questions on the budget and the school question, so not to the motion. Okay, we're, we're on the motion to separate votes here. Is, is there any further discussion with respect to separating these motions? Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Um, could we scroll down? Uh, name and... John Graziano, 8 Kimball Road. Keep going. So I think that, and I apologize, I don't remember the gentleman who preceded me at the mic. I think his question is actually pretty valid because what it says up there is appropriation committee recommends approval. And That's, that still holds. But they just said they didn't vote on it. <laughs> they didn't know it was in there, so how can they recommend? So, I, I, and again, I, I think well, the I, reason I'm up here is because I think that's a valid question if. Hold on, then hold on a second. Mr. Manning, would you address uh, the, the position of the Appropriations Committee with respect to Article 10 as it is currently constructed? They said they weren't aware of it. So we voted on it essentially uh, they voted to, approve, to approve the operational budget. Right. And we also did see today that it, there was a non-binding part to have a underwrite. So since it's non-binding and there's still a vote, 
it really has no overall impact on the operational budget. So we could have revoted it, we could have discussed it, but we don't have a particular position on the underwrite itself. Our position is approving the budget. Okay, and I just want to make sure clarification. So you did not vote on the underwrite section of that at all? We did not take a specific vote, but we were voting on the overall operational budget. Okay. I, I, so I'm going to say I, I support the amendment, but I do also question, and I don't know if town council can weigh in on the appropriateness of it, given what the document says. Well, again, I don't see a need for that, but you know, let, let's let me try to clarify the the this circumstance with a motion before us to separate votes. Let, let's say that that passes. That that there's a that we agree to separate votes. And let's say you vote down the underwrite, okay? Then what happens at the ballot doesn't matter. Effectively, it won't be before us. I don't, no, I don't think that's true. It is true. If, if, if this meeting doesn't vote, if we separate the issues, if we separate the issues and we have a separate vote on an underwrite, and this meeting turns that underride down, you, you vote at the ballot box, it has no effect. The vote, at the, the vote tonight has no effect. No. He's nodding when I said that. <laughs> I mean, I'll, okay. I, I'm gonna, I'll correct myself. The fact that it says non-binding, um, you're right. I, I just, yes. and I'll leave the microphone, but okay. I think the expedient thing to do would actually be to remove it entirely and not vote on it tonight since it doesn't matter. Well, we, we, have, a, we have a motion to separate. At, at this point, we have a motion to separate votes. So we've got to continue along with consideration of that separation. On my right. Mr. Moderator, I, I, as the maker of the motion, I would accept uh, instead to simply delete the underwrite section, the non-binding underwrite part of the budget. Are you, are you rescinding your original motion? No, are you rescinding your original motion? Yes, I'm willing to rescind the original motion in favor of an amendment to simply delete the non-binding vote on the underwrite. All right, so a motion has been made to, <laughs> the, a motion has been made to remove, and, and I assume it's been seconded, to remove the language that relates to a non-binding resolution, which has no effect anyway. <clears throat> uh, is there any discussion on the revised motion to remove the language relating to a non-binding resolution? Mr. Moderator? Yes. John Palmer, 87 Main Street. Um, before I vote on this, I would like to understand what the pros and the cons are of uh, the underwrite. I need that so I can make an intelligent vote. Who would like to? Uh, Mr. Manning, would you like to take a shot at that? Mr. Moderator, sir, thank you. The uh, town prepared a paper that compared the pros and cons of uh, the underwrite. Is that the question? And uh, the pros were identified as being that an underwrite would signal a commitment to control spending at current levels rather than baselining spending on a levy limit that accumulated over a long period that it would require specific override discussions for substantial future spending increase proposals with more focus than the normal budget process provides, that it would drive town administrators to focus on cost control, and that it may signal conservatism to lenders, which could enhance the perception of creditworthiness for us. 
and we noted the very uh, high importance we place on our triple A bond rating, which saves us about 7.1% in costs on our debt service. Uh, the pros also pointed out that if exigent conditions arise, an underride can be reversed by an override by the same voting bodies with the same approval requirements after conscious public consideration of specific circumstances. We identified some cons, uh, and we pointed out that a long-standing unused tax levy may be considered an element of financial strength and discipline. And if so, the elimination of the unused tax levy could reduce the perception of creditworthiness. Uh, we pointed out that for bond rating purposes, the existing unused levy may set offset other weaknesses like the town stabilization fund status, which was $459,000 below the target threshold at the time the paper was written. We pointed out that an ongoing cycle of alternating underrides and overrides could degrade investor and stakeholder confidence. Uh, and we pointed out that the elimination of unused levy could restrict consideration of meritorious service and investment opportunities to the town's long-term de detriment. And then we provided a little sensitivity analysis of what the underwrite tax impact would be in the out years. And the Board of Selectmen held a lengthy debate on those pros and cons and came to a vote to recommend the underwrite. That is the analysis that was provided right down the middle. Uh, I think identifying a robust sets of pros and cons. Thank you. On my right. Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street. Um, I just wanted to, it, this is moving pretty fast. Um, are there two votes needed, one at town meeting and one at the ballot for an underride, or only the vote at the ballot is necessary for the underride? Only the ballot at the, uh, uh, on May 20 is, is necessary. Okay. Because, just, because this has been presented as a non-binding resolution. Okay. I just want to make a comment. Um, to <clears throat> the first comment we had um, from the town manager when this question started to be asked was, in the interest of transparency, we did it this way. Um, and I think that this way was the wrong way to do it. People didn't know what to expect and how to interact with this. On my left. Don Wilson for Schofield. Uh, just looking for clarification. If we remove the underride from this uh, article tonight, will the underride still appear at the ballot box? Yes, it will. Thank you. On my right. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, I think we should leave the situation as it is and vote on it as it is, as it is non-binding, as we've been told several times. I think that this Board of Selectmen has worked uh, together very well, Democrats, Republican, Independents. Uh, as elected officials, they've represented our uh, management needs of the town and come up with an excellent budget that an underwrite possibility. Uh, the Appropriation Committee has done an excellent job supporting the numbers and presenting their numbers. And I think the fiscally responsible thing to do is to move ahead and vote on this non-binding. Again, we're, we're having a discussion on an amendment to remove the language relating to the non-binding resolution. Is there further discussion on that motion to amend? Okay, if, if there's no further discussion on that motion, we'll take a vote on a motion to remove the language relating to the non-binding resolution. All those in favor of removing the language relating to the non-binding resolution signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. That's a clear majority. And now we return to the, to the main motion under the article. Is there any further discussion on the budget? I have a question. My name is Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street. It's on preparation of enrollment. I want to say the school presentation was fabulous. I moved here in the late 90s and the boom in the 90s. I've had three children go through the Hoppington public school system. Education is very important to me still, even though my children aren't in the school system. 
When my daughter came here in second grade, her class was the largest class that Hopkinton had seen at that point. Accommodations were made that to keep class sizes down, two classrooms went to center school, the rest of the kids, two class, the kids were at Elmwood at that time, she was at Elmwood, but two classes went to center. They bust them back and forth during events. That way they could have smaller class sizes and keep the students together during events. My son, when he was in Elmwood school, that was the year the modular classrooms were added. Um, and I was at first very apprehensive to hear my son was gonna be in a modular classroom, but I will say it was a very good classroom. He, it was a way to add size to the school and keep size class sizes down. You had said that if we get enrollment over the grades, we can handle it. But if we get active enrollment in sixth grade or other grades, we won't be able to handle it. What are you doing in preparation of the budget in the school budget to deal with that enrollment if it happens? We're going into the busy real estate season. People are gonna be selling their houses. Is there any plans to look at the schools to get modular classrooms added where they can? Can Marathon Elementary School that we just built accommodate something like that if enrollment does increase that you can't handle the kindergarten enrollment for that school, kindergarten first and second grade? Um, what are you doing Hi. in preparation of that? Dr. Kavanaugh. So I do like that um, you are asking this question. I think for FY20, we're not going to need to worry about modular classrooms. As I had explained to a previous questioner, uh, we would be able to do things like art on a cart or health on a cart. Uh, but we are looking at an SOI at Elmwood, as I said, adding high school classrooms, and we may need to put modular classrooms um, over at Hopkins. You know, someone had asked about how we sort of monitor enrollment. It's very difficult to do that because when someone sells an existing home in Hopkinton and someone else buys that home, we don't know if it will be a family with three school-age children, two school-age children, five or no school-aged children. Um, and, and as I've said, Welcome Wagon has been exceedingly helpful to us in this because they're giving us numbers even um, of preschool-aged children so that we can kind of watch where, where that's happening. So I will tell you that we are monitoring numbers daily. daily um, and if we do get a great influx at a particular grade level, we are prepared in terms of our physical plants to handle that. We will need to hire faculty. That will have to happen. A very good example is kindergarten last year. We had planned on you know, 12 kindergarten classrooms and we were going to split paraprofessionals, one para for every two classrooms. What we ended up doing was hiring paras and keeping the class sizes at 21, which is technically high for kindergarten. You know, it wouldn't be high in fourth grade at all, but at kindergarten it is. So we do make modifications as the, the school year begins and we try to keep class sizes low and our kids in good classrooms. Mr. Moderator, I just want to ask Ms. Dr. Kavanaugh one more question. Have you looked at all of the schools to see if you can add modular classrooms, or is it only specific schools that would be able to have them? Some of the schools, when they were drawn, actually had places where you could put those classrooms. So, for example, you know, Hopkins has that place in the back. Uh, what we really would like to do is to add those six classrooms to the high school, physically attach them to the high school, right. because everything is there. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wiseman. Ken Weissman, 145 Ash Street. I move the question. Okay. Is there a second? second? All those in favor of ending debate on this topic? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We're ready for a vote on Article 10, as amended. <clears throat> All those in favor of Article 10 as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. And it's nearly unanimous and passes. $92.7 million. Article 11, fiscal year 2020 revolving fund spending limits. Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 11, uh, fiscal year 2020 revolving fund spending limits. Uh, we move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and motions document. Okay. Essentially, this is uh, 
uh, recertifying or reapproving our uh, revolving fund spending limits. Um, these limits are basically the same as, you, as last year, uh, essentially, but we have to re reapprove them every year. Okay. Any questions on this article? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 12, PEG Access Enterprise Fund. Board of Selectmen. Recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 12, PEG Access Enterprise Fund. Uh, we move the articles written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is setting up uh, an enterprise fund uh, for uh, HCAM, essentially, and it's really to take in uh, Comcast is providing the funding for this, so it's $50,000 going into this, into this fund that we're creating. Any questions? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 13, Chapter 90, Highway Funds. Board of Selectmen? Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements Committee? Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And then Mr. Manning? Article 13, Chapter 90, Highway Funds. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, essentially, this is uh, Chapter 90 funds. Um, this represents uh, the amount established to be paid by the state to support the town's pavement management plan and assist in maintaining the pavement condition index of the town. Any questions? This is money coming to us from the state. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 14, transfer to general stabilization fund. Ms. Wright? The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning? Article 14, transfer to the general stabilization fund. We move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Uh, essentially, this is uh, moving uh, $208,000 uh, from, uh, from free cash into our uh, general stabilization fund. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? So it's unanimous and so voted. Article 15, Establishment of School Department Stabilization Fund, acceptance of fourth paragraph of MGL Chapter 40, et cetera, et cetera. Board of Selectmen, Ms. Ms. Wright. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. School Committee. The School Committee recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Okay, Article 15, Establishment of School Department Stabilization Fund. Uh, essentially, uh, we move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is establishment of a stabilization fund, uh, specifically to take uh, money coming from legacy funds uh, based on the host community agreement. Um, and it's going to be a place where we can, where the town will hold the $500,000. And I believe in this motion, is uh, $200,000 to be transferred uh, to the schools from the School Department Stabilization Fund uh, to be used by the schools. Okay. Is there, are there any questions? Yeah, a, a question, uh, Mr. Moderator, Joe Markey, 39 mm -hmm. Ash Street, and having been on the planning board when, when we did this uh, with others here too, a uh, question for appropriation, uh, when you said the 500000 is that due to the fact that Legacy Farms has, in fact, introduced more school-aged children than was uh, modeled in the host community agreement? And does it also include a per-pupil uh, fee for a number of students over that limit? So this initial $500,000 is because uh, the enrollment from Legacy Farms exceeded uh, what was written in the, uh, um, the host community agreement. And that $500,000 is not a part of the per pupil ongoing, I believe. But I do believe it will go into that fund, this fund, as we move forward. Mr. Moderator, may I just speak to that for a minute, please? Go ahead. Um, this 
fund will recommends requires town meeting to establish the stabilization fund with the 500,000 payment that has already been made because as you explained we have gone over the target 200,000 has been requested by the school committee to give them access probably this fall when they get those additional enrollments so that they can access the funds without town meeting approval. Additional funds as they come in with those later payments as you referred to going forward, those will be able to go directly into the fund. Future withdrawals from the fund will again need town meeting approval. So this um, article tonight is to establish the fund. It is to establish the fund and to expend 200,000 of the, of the 500 initial deposit. Any other questions? Am I right? Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, I'm totally for the school getting a stabilization fund for this. Uh, my question is, in, um, is part three where it says not less than 25% of all the receipts. This whole host community agreement, the whole $500,000, Shouldn't it all belong to the school and be at their will when they need it and not have to come before town meeting as these funds come in, they, don't they belong to the school? Mr. Kamalo. The motion, bullet number three, specifically says dedicate 100%. Why does it say not less than 25% of receipts right there? So if, if a, why would they have to come before town meeting to get the money that belongs to them in the first place with the host community agreement? This, this money, the, the whole thing was based on the schools having this money. If, if I may, yeah. with the town moderator, the article was written the way it was, referencing 25%, because that's what the law prescribes. Right, so However, nowhere does it say 100%. No. Okay, it says so in the motion number three. The, the motion percentage 100 is because it's greater than 25, dedicates all the funds to the, to the school. It's, it's contradictory. So the small one that was signed off on, on the 24th, is different than the big one. The paperwork is I mean, different. Is there, is there any it question? contradicts each other. It's, again, I do not see through the town moderator. I can Mr. understand Kamala. why you feel that way. However, if you read carefully, it says not less than 25%. That's the article. And then the motion says, well, since it's not less than 25%, it is 100%. Well, let me, I'm let me have, I'm reading hold on, hold, gave out two hold on, tonight. hold on. Excuse me. Town Council will address this. Mr. Miaris. Good evening. The statute that we are uh, accepting in part two of this motion allows the town to dedicate any identifiable revenue stream to go directly into a stabilization fund without a further town meeting vote. That statute says that you identify the revenue stream and you specify a percentage not less than 25%. So the warrant article says to establish a percentage not less than 25%. The motion that you are being asked to vote on sets that percentage at 100%, which is a percentage that is not less than 25%. So all of the money that comes in from Legacy Farms to address school population issues will, if this gets uh, adopted go directly into the stabilization fund. So that still leaves me with two questions. One is why did we get two different handouts that contradict each other? But the other part is um, why, did, why does the school committee have to come before town meeting each other to ask for the funds? Shouldn't it just be there as they need it? Well, I can address the first one. They don't contradict each other. When you write a, a, uh, an, a warrant, you give, you try to give, when it's possible, town meeting the maximum uh, amount of discretion. So it, it, the warrant just says that the town meeting will be asked to set the percentage, not less than 
The motion that's before you sets the percentage at 100. As far as, as, far as the second question, I'll leave that to uh, uh, the policymakers. So the second question is why the school committee has to come back to town meeting for subsequent expenditures. Who can address that? I think it's best um, expressed in that this, however these funds are expended, they must be addressing the impacts of the legacy farms enrollment. They, we all understand, can't be used for any type of school expenditure whatsoever. So this is to protect us all that these are truly expended for expenditures that qualify as mitigation and so there is a required amount of oversight to make sure that we stay within the legal requirements of what is considered mitigation for legacy farms does that answer the question darling as, as what it is on my left hi mary andrew skevich at 46 east view road I'm curious about the host community agreements, not necessarily specific to legacy farms, but in general, when we think about what we've seen for growth and what might be in the future, do we have any statistics that tell us that the amount of what these um, um, builders are paying into or what the legal agreements are for what they owe the town because of um, Oh, um, exceeding the amount of students they expect to come in. Do we have any kind of statistics that tell us that the, va the amount we're identifying as their cost is fair? Um, <clears throat> when I think about some of the increases we're talking about for the schools, especially if we have to build schools, do we need to revisit these host community agreements well, to maybe have, have these organizations for future ones? Let me, how do we know that they're appropriate yeah, let going me, forward? Let me cut it off at this point. I mean, that's okay as a question specific to legacy farms. And actually, it's not even in the four corners of this article. That, that's a, that is a broad question. This article simply says we're due, we have received $500,000. However, you know, however it was determined, and so what we're addressing is where that 500,000 should be placed and whether 200,000 of that 500,000 should be spent in the next fiscal year for the benefit of the schools. You yeah. know, the, the broad question about whether that, that's the right number, whether the agreement is fair, whether the agreement fully funds the obligation is outside of the scope of this article. Okay. And better I presented can, to I, the planning board in subsequent discussions. No, and I, I said I can appreciate that. So I certainly want to be able to table that or figure out how to table that kind of investigation going forward. But I guess I would turn my question into, do we know for what the um, miss was from Legacy Farms in terms of the number of students they're going to be sending to the schools? Do we have an idea how much it might cost us? Because as much as we don't know the ages necessarily, but do we have any statistics or are there some kind of um, studies out there that tell us that per, per pupil kinds of costs are wh whether or not we're actually um, below water already in terms of accepting these funds? Or do we know, like I said, it might actually be sufficient? Uh, again, I think that's, that's not a question for us right here because it, it's not simply relating to 500,000. It relates to the, to the um, residential tax revenue that comes in from from legacy, the 500 is an increment above that, and, and it, it's clear to me that we, it just doesn't fit within the four corners of the discussion tonight. Again, I would address that either to the selectmen going forward, to the, to the planning board, if another type of agreement like this comes forward. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mary Dole of 18 Walcott Valley Drive. Um, I just have a question. If we have a check, from Legacy Farms right now for 500,000 and we're opening a stabilization fund in accordance to the host agreement, which, which I'm looking at right now, and it says a one-time payment of 500,000 right off the bat, why are we not depositing the whole 500 into this stabilization fund? We are. We are, we are both depositing the 500 
and expending 200 in the next fiscal year. So what remains after the expenditure is the, the balance of 300 and any future uh, funds that come into, under the host agreement into the stabilization fund. Okay, I don't think that was clear where it says 200,000 and not, nowhere does it say 500,000 in the stabilization. Dr. Cavanaugh, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think I'll just summarize this very briefly. So $500,000 are already in the town's coffers. A two-thirds vote from you tonight will put that money into a stabilization fund. Um, when you put that money in there, 200000 of the 500000 is already appropriated in the event that our enrollment issues rise to the level of needing additional personnel or something else um, to mitigate that enrollment. All subsequent revenue streams from legacy farms will also go into that stabilization <coughs> fund. And I guess the short answer to how it comes out of there is it will have to come out by two-thirds vote of this town meeting, but it will be recommended by the school committee and endorsed by the town's financial officer. Okay. Any other questions with respect to this article? Okay, if not, uh, all those in favor of this article Signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and clearly a two-thirds majority. <clears throat> it's not less than two-thirds, so therefore 100% is greater than two-thirds. And, and that is not in conflict. <laughs> Article 16, transfer to OPEB liability trust fund. Board of Selectmen, Ms. Wright. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Mr. Manning. Article 16, transfer to other post-employment benefits liability trust fund. We move the motion and written as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this is voting to transfer uh, $400,000 uh, for OPEP. So we've been discussing this. Any, any further questions on this article? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 17, pay as you go capital expenses. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And then Mr. Manning. Article 17, pay as you go capital expenses. We move the motion as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this is uh, taking uh, $1,358,121.56 uh, from the general <coughs> free cash uh, to pay for various capital goes, ex ca pay, I'm sorry, pay as you go capital expenses, and also uh, $6,312.44 from unspent capital appropriations uh, to be used for the capital expenses. And I don't know if you want me to go through the different uh, items, but, uh, or just people can ask questions on them. Well, let's entertain questions. On my right. Carol DeBurr, 47 Chamberlain Street. The, um, in past years, the Appropriation Committee used to have a nice little cheat sheet that broke down all the expenses. Is that in here somewhere? Pages 14 and 15. Okay, thank you. <laughs> on my left. Hello, Bill Simpson, uh, 5 Constitution. The, some of the prices on some of the replacement equipment, like that fire chief car and a few of the other things, seem higher than they could be appropriated for. It seems like a greater level of so-called shopping could be done on the prices of these items. Mr. Manning, could you, uh, or, or our CFO, could we speak to the issue of how the numbers are determined? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the budget process involved department heads identifying their requirements, uh, going through a round of meetings with the town manager, going through several rounds of meetings with the Board of Selectmen, meeting with the Capital Improvements Committee, and meeting with the Appropriations Committee. Uh, there were tough sessions with a lot of questions. 
There were some revisions. There was talk about trade-in values. There, there was talk about alternative procurement um, methods that could be employed. And these were the dollar amounts that were settled upon. And if there's a specific question on a specific item, uh, we have the relevant department heads here who could get up and talk about uh, the complexity or requirement for for uh, some of these specific items. So I can say the process was robust and we could answer questions about any specific item if you would like to hear about that. Do you, do you have a specific uh, item or two that you want to question? In this case, the cost of repairing the floor in the jail and the cost of the automobile for the police chief, and I know we're going to get another one in a couple more of these flips. It's going to be a hook and ladder truck said to be valued at one and a half million or so. Those figures seem like shopping around could find a, a significantly lower cost. So, for so the let's, item. let's start with the uh, re repair sure. of the jail cell floor. So I have some knowledge on that if the city engineer is not available. The floor of the jail is a poured concrete slab and it was coated with a cosmetic polymeric coating. Oh, here we go. You'll get the, you'll get the complete answer. <laughs> Please. Do you, do you have a slide? Yes. <laughs> Any slide? Is, is there a particular... Hey Josh, can we have a presentation? Well, maybe as they're getting to this, the... Uh... Uh, wrong one. The uh, police station was built, it's, it's, it's 15 years ago now, there's an epoxy floor system for the jail cell. Um, for this article... Um, Into the microphone. Yeah, I was just saying. Um, <laughs> we, we did receive estimates and proposals from two different uh, contractors for this work. Um, and that's kind of what we based the estimate off since it's a, such a round number. Uh, and, and that includes uh, a contingency for the estimate is will be a year old. Um, and to cover some of the, the bidding costs, since this is going to have to go out to bid uh, with the cost being that much money. And we do, and it was an item E, Josh, under this article. Another one is the elevator controls. There we go, I'm sorry. It's $75,000. Is that the whole elevator, you know, the car and the winch and the stuff? I'll get to that question. Oh, hold, hold on. This is the right after this. The, the, yeah. the oh, presentation up there is just showing the existing floor in the police station. Um, the poor condition it is. It is in and it has failed the public. It is a there's a state inspection for the for the cells, um, and it has failed. This is a very hard kind of epoxy flooring system. Those pieces can actually be broken up and and, and actually be used to harm folks. So it really is imperative to to replace the floors and the prices, as I said, they, they, these are actual actual bid prices from contractors. It's a specialty kind of system that gets applied. It's a, as Tim was saying, it's a it's an, an epoxy type of floor covering. Um, and the state it's in, the, the floor area, it all has to be removed and it has to be re-sanded and has to be re, uh, reapplied. Um, Couldn't linoleum or something like that be put instead? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's... I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly, but I think this type of floor system is. is I don't know if it's required for for jail cell system, but it has to be a. Uh, you know, it has to be a safe system that can't. It, it can't be removed. From, well, this from, is the least one. No. Some of the other ones, like the elevator control, right? And the, and the hook the, and ladder truck. Well, can can as you speak the to the elevator controls? As for the elevator controls, no, it's not. It's the. It's all the controls for the elevator itself, but not the the actual mechanical system for the elevator. Uh, so and, it, and again, that's a, that is an estimated 
price from a, an elevator company, and we it's actually been reduced 25% uh, with the, that 25% is going to be coming out of the facilities budget for uh, uh, emergency type repairs. So we're, we're, we're trying to be as diligent as possible. And I guess it's too early to be talking about the hook and lash. Yes, so. it is. That's the fire oh. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. On my right. Uh, Ken Dietz, 44 Alexander Road. I was wondering what the criteria was in determining you know, that these vehicles needed to be replaced, in particular the Chief's car and the DPW trucks. You know, how was it decided that they should be replaced? Is that capital improvements or is that uh, the fire chief? It's the respective departments. Okay. Good evening. So specific to the uh, fire chief's car, uh, I have a 10-year capital plan. Uh, it's our goal to uh, utilize our cars about eight years. We do assess them as we go and assess the plan as we go. Uh, so the car that's on the, uh, that we're looking at tonight is uh, 2011. It's in a fairly good shape. The car that we're about to replace it with is, uh, is actually um, a smaller vehicle. I have a Tahoe right now. This will be a Ford Explorer. And it is, um, it has a, uh, I always say electric car, but let me make sure I say this correct. It is a hybrid. Uh, we do spend slightly more on the engine. That's some of the pieces we do. <clears throat> the quote for that is $39,000. That's a state bid list quote um, for just an admin explorer. And then we add some, um, there's a tactical board, a command board that we haven't replaced in three cars. So it's about 20 years old and it gets to, this is kind of when we worked into the cycle. There's about $3,700 worth of technology that just allows me to have mobile data terminals, allows us to access our software and have it be um, cellular in connection. Hope I use the right term. And uh, it comes with a radio that is, uh, it's about $5,000 for me to have like a three band radio that interoperability. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's about $2,000 to have gear storage so that uh, the gear doesn't stay out in the car and off gas, and it has to do with cancer and some protection. So those are the cost factors that run into a car. Okay. So basically, you're replacing the car on age, and all of the rest of the stuff is understood. Yes, in, in the capital planning, it's basically based on age. Okay, thank you. Mr. Westerling. Good evening, through you, Mr. Moderator. My name is John Westerling. It's my privilege and honor to serve as your Director of Public Works. To the question of public works vehicles replacements, we also have a 10-year capital replacement plan where we evaluate all of our vehicles. Uh, we're looking at two vehicles under this, uh, this particular article. One is 13 years old with 95,000 miles on it. It's received $27,000 worth of repairs. And the second is a 10-year-old dump truck with 110,000 miles on it, also receives $27,000 worth of repairs. And both of these are coming off the state bid list, which is a procurement process which doesn't require the town to go through the process. The state goes through the process and offers these vehicles to all communities. So we are getting a competitive price without going through the, the procurement process. But it does conform to procurement laws. OK, thank you. On my left. Hi, Nancy Emrick, 8 Winter Street. Um, to continue on with that, I don't think we heard about P replacing the police cruisers. Um, some detail about that would be helpful, as well as C, the feasibility study for the fire station. I'd like some further details about that. If the respective chiefs would come forward. The uh, police cruiser is a regular, uh, we have a fleet and we keep up a regular maintenance uh, of the vehicle. We track all the mileage of the cars and we try to keep the mileage down to 80,000, which is an accreditation standard. Um, we're down like five cars that are above that mileage. Uh, we requested three last year, three the year before. We received two cars uh, both years and we're trying to catch up now. We did do some innovative work by using a gift to supplement our fleet, to keep our head above water. 
but uh, we've also uh, had quite a bit of uh, maintenance fees this year because we're trying to keep the older cruise, cruises up and on the road. But we do our best to schedule the cruises, uh, not to use them 24-7, and um, it's just the, the three will get, will get us at a good place. And it's a, a, usually a, a regular occurrence. Thank you. Chief Slayman. Thanks. So uh, I thank you in advance for consideration tonight on the uh, public safety feasibility study. The assessment would include existing building conditions, police and fire, and some uh, potential existing buildings should we face them. It would identify deficiencies and impediments to department operations. It would provide programming and space needs analysis. It would generate building options for two fire stations, public safety, we don't know what the outcome is yet, and options of the uh, probable cost for each. The options will include conceptual site and building plans and single floor plans. We will deliver a master plan for the station, stations, plural, and locations. And finally, the group study will prepare and submit the final report and present the findings and options developed. Appreciate your consideration on this. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, are these backup stations, um, police stations and fire stations? Are we at max capacity with our existing facilities? So this started uh, about two years ago just uh, looking at the fire station specifically. We, we, we knew we were approaching capacity. Um, it's 20 years old. It uh, was designed to last 50 years. Uh, we will be at capacity this year on our current staffing design. So it just came quicker than uh, what they designed for 20 years ago. In that study, we realized there are other areas of town. We covered 28 square miles. So it is normal to think about different districting districts in responses to work on your response times at this point. That's just for fire. When we went through the exercise with Town Hall and the flood, we realized uh, we may need to look at some redundancy in our system, so we are starting studying police, fire, dispatch, emergency management, and trying to make sure that if we do a project with fire that we actually look at everything. It's public safety all naturally flows under one umbrella anyways. So we'll look at a, specifically we're looking at a second location and whether we need additional capacity for the police or dispatch for emergency management when we study the site. And just one more. So could you use the Woodville station or Pi station or not? So in this first snapshot that we did, um, we, we, we actually ran our historic data. It turns out that the Woodville station is in a rural area and it and where we're going to, looking forward, it most likely won't come on the radar as the second best location to respond from. And the current building has some major deficiencies. The site itself has some major deficiencies. I don't want to jump too far ahead because we are supposed to study it, but I can tell you that it's, it's got some flaws that are very challenging. On my right. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Uh, my questions are for H and N. The, uh, I'll start with the boiler. What school is getting the new boiler? And um, what uh, the wetland order of conditions, uh, $40,000, uh, what project was that related to? Um, cause I, I know we have a lot of things we're covering, uh, but I don't exactly remember that. And Dr. Kavanaugh? So the boiler is for the Hopkinton Middle School. And the wetland order of conditions is something that has been uh, unresolved for the past 20 years. And I think every year it just kind of gets put on the back burner. So we're hoping to get that resolved this year. So to clarify through the uh, moderator, uh, this is for the loop road. Uh, this is an order of conditions that was from the original build of the fields for when um, the high school in the loop road Okay, so which means that eventually when these orders are met, uh, we'll be able to have Chapter 90 money for the Blue Pro, which I fully endorse. 
Well, this will this will this uh, will not create the loop road to be a public road. That's that's a different that's different. Well, that would save us a lot of uh, tax money. Okay, but forward. that's not what that's not what this request is for. This is to um, recreate wetlands that were lost when the high school fields were created, but it is not to make the loop road a public road. I understand what you're asking, but that's All not right. what the intent of this wetlands. Because we've been asking for a long time too, as well. But good luck. Thank you. <laughs> On my right. Uh, Joe Sridava, 21 Hearthstone Road. Just a question through the moderator for the schools on um, K, the data center replacement. Just looking for a little more clarity as to what the data center entails, if it's servers, networking. Sat down too quickly. <laughs> I'm going to invite Mr. Goshtan, who is the director of technology. He'll be able to answer that for you. Good evening, uh, through Mr. Moderator. Uh, the data center replacement is the main data center at the high school. This is a joint uh, town school facility where all of the mission critical uh, systems are placed and housed, and it's about nine years old and needs an update. That will be for specifically for three servers uh, in that facility. That so answer the question? Oh, through the moderator, so these servers are both for the town and for the schools? It's, it's roughly a 70, 30 percent share. Okay, thank you. And we're building in redundancy with other servers at the, the fire and town side. So we can fail over from some of the servers there to the schools and vice versa from schools over town when there's emergencies that happen, like water damage, et cetera, at some of the facilities. And one final question through the moderator. What's the life, uh, estimated life, of this once it's replaced? Uh, through the moderator, uh, the expected life is, is hopefully the same, roughly eight to nine years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it seems like uh, I, I've been in technology for many years. Name, name like, and address? Sorry, John Cardillo, uh, 84 Winter. Um, I've been in technology for many years. It seems like, um, Eight to nine years is a long time, and you can save a great deal of money by moving a lot of the technology and the support to the cloud. Is that feasible? And it, you know, in terms of replacing, you don't replace hardware. Somebody else replaces hardware. There's overhead costs, but uh, moving to the cloud seems to be the way to go. Uh, through the moderator. Correct, I would agree with that statement. Uh, some of our key systems are hosted in the cloud, uh, but there are other core systems that we do still choose to maintain internally. Um, for example, print servers and other security systems, we keep those internally for specific reasons, but some of our core systems are, are still hosted in the cloud. So we, we do look to, to save costs by doing that. Any other questions on this article? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. On Article 17, pay as you go capital expenses. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Nearly unanimous. Article 18, purchase of valve maintenance trailer system. Ms. Wright for the selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital improvements. Capital improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 18, purchase of a valve maintenance trailer system. Uh, we move the motion as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this is $65,000 for a, uh, a maintenance trailer system. It gives us uh, the ability uh, to be used during emergencies to close water gate valves, shut down water mains, and as a maintenance tool to exercise gate valves and keep them operational. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of Article 18 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous. Article 19, purchase of water department truck. 
Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital improvements. Capital improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 19, purchase of a water department truck. We move the motion as written in the one articles and motions document. Essentially, this is $50,000 um, from the water enterprise uh, fund uh, for the purchase of a, of a truck. Any questions? All those in favor of purchasing a water department truck, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Nearly unanimous. <laughs> and so voted. <laughs> Article 20, purchase of bucket truck. Board of Selectmen, Ms. Wright. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital improvements. Recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 20, purchase of a bucket truck. We move the motion as written in the Warren Articles and Motions document. Uh, this is $100,000 to uh, purchase a bucket truck uh, to be used by the DPW for tree maintenance and removal, as well as for building maintenance by the facilities department. Any questions? Mr. Moderator, Joe Regan, 37 Front Street. For some strange reason, I wholeheartedly support this. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know that. <laughs> Served as tree warden for seven years back in the 90s, and it was a very frustrating thing to try to do stuff for the town. Uh, you would get a call, and you would re it was reactive. It was never proactive. Didn't have the money. We didn't have the personnel. And there was so much that just could not be done. And if you were around a year ago this March, and you went through that snowstorm where you could not get down the roads, or even on a good day, if you're out walking or jogging or riding your bike, you, are, you, you find yourself getting more and more in the middle of the road. We hope that, I hope that this purchase of a bucket will be the start to get a tree department going here in town. Buy the bucket, we will train some of the DPW personnel. Gradually, you can hire some people to have a dedicated tree department. You need one badly in this town, and I certainly hope that we will vote to uh, purchase this bucket truck. Thank you. With that ringing endorsement, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 21, purchase of multi-purpose municipal tractor. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And capital improvements? Capital improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 21, purchase of a multi-purpose municipal tractor. tractor. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, this is $177,000 to be used for the purchase of a multi-purpose multi municipal tractor um, with a plow, blower, sander, and dump body to be used throughout the year, but primarily to be used for snow and ice removal on the growing sidewalk network. On my left. Hello. Uh the size of this tractor at $177,000, is it three feet wide and six feet long, or is it more like, you know, a 938 front end loader or something like that? Through you, Mr. Moderator, it is sized so that it will fit on the sidewalks. It is approximately oh. uh, four feet wide and oh, four, probably right. about eight feet long, similar to the other two that we currently operate on the sidewalks. So just to clarify, it's not as large as the ladder truck. It is not. No. <laughs> but it seems a little small for $177,000. Mr. Grossetti, would you please bring up the slide showing the, the vehicle? Well, that's what I thought. So that's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. For that it, much? For that much. And it needs to be of a size that isn't too large to fit on the sidewalks, squeeze between utility poles and walls, but still do an effective job at clearing the snow. Okay. Okay. On my right. Dave Paul, 7 Meadowland Drive. Uh, I think the picture just answered my question. I was going to ask if it's a thrower versus a plower because the thrower is much better to use. And just, I guess I'll change my question and say the existing two, are they also throwers? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, they can both push and throw depending upon how much snow, the weight of the snow. Just a follow-up comment in general. I just wanted to compliment the, the town boards and department's heads. I, I think we've thrown a lot of questions at them, and they're well prepared with pictures and descriptions, and it's proof that uh, they're not just uh, spending our money curiously. 
on their behalf. We thank you. On my left. Uh, Francis D. Young, 3 Doyle Lane. Uh, John, is this incremental to the two existing blowers that you mentioned previously? Through the moderator, yes it is. And just what's the rationale for adding a third? Have we been, have we been neglecting because we don't have the ability or capacity, or is this kind of used to be a long-term replacement for one of the other two? Uh, through the moderator, we currently remove snow from a network of approximately 17 miles of sidewalk. Um, it takes roughly 8 to 16 hours with the two vehicles that we have. And we have to take operators that have been out working for hours or perhaps days working on the roads. So we take them out and we put them in these two vehicles. It takes 8 to 16 hours. With a third vehicle, we'll be able to clear the snow and provide safe travel on the sidewalks in a much more efficient and quick manner. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of Article 21, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Clearly a two-thirds majority, and so voted. Article 22, Sewer Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan Update. Ms. Wright? Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning? Article 20, sewer, Article 22, Sewer Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan Update. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is $170,000 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund borrowing uh, to update the town's 2004 Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan to reassess areas in town of critical need for sewer service. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous, clearly a two-thirds majority. Uh, remember that we, move, we agreed <coughs> at the outset to move Article 53 to follow Article 22 since they were related. So Article 53 is now on the floor. And I will call on, um, is it Maureen Belger? Yes, sir. To make a motion. All right. Maureen Belger, 14 Colella Farm Road, and we move that the town vote to take no action on Article 53. Okay. So that you understand, that means that no action means that uh, essentially this is effectively being withdrawn. Correct. Is there any discussion with respect to this article? Okay. All those in favor of taking no action on this article signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And so no action will be taken. Now we return to Article 23. Sidewalk Master Plan Phase 2. Ms. Wright. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 23, Sidewalk Master Plan, Phase 2. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, this is uh, $1,060,000 from general fund borrowing, design and construction of the second phase of the five-year sidewalk plan on West Main Street and Wood Street. Uh, the appropriation represent a portion of phase two of the sidewalk plan outlined in the town master plan. Questions on my left. Tom Terry, 17 Maple Street. Um, I had a discussion regarding this issue with um, board chairman uh, John Westerling and I uh, had a few questions and I was hoping to get them either answered through you or by him. I had talked with him about uh, th this, th this proposal is for $100,000 to do a sidewalk on Wood Street over by the highway barn. It's also uh, $960,000 to do a sidewalk that's going to go from um, L Lumber Street to um, Downey Street. Do, but before you go further, do we have a picture of the, of the areas 
in question. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Terry. That's more or less what I'm getting to also. But, um, so I called John and I asked him um, about the $960,000 appropriation. I'm 100% in favor of the 100,000 for the sidewalk over at the, five, at the uh, highway barn. And my first question was, do you have a set of plans I could review, John? And he said, no, we don't have any plans. We, don't, we didn't do it that way. I said, well, how did the selectmen vote on it if they went, didn't know what they were voting on? How did the appropriations committee vote on it if they didn't know the vote? He said, well, that's the procedure we do. And in that money is some money uh, set aside for getting a bid so that then we can come back and we can tell you exactly how we got to $960,000. And <clears throat> the only way I found out how they got to the $960,000 was uh, there was a ballpark figure uh, looking at the history of building sidewalks. It seemed about a good number to so throw on a piece of paper. And I don't really understand how uh, it's, it's such an issue, not so much money, it's a safety issue because that sidewalk is going to go from basically Cumberland Farms all the way to Downey Street. And eventually, part of the plan was to continue the sidewalk down Downey Street. When I heard that, I said, oh my God, Downey Street, you can't get two cars to pass down there. You're going to put a sidewalk there. So I walked down the street one Sunday, a week ago Sunday. I stopped at Cumberland's. I went across a, a giant pond on my left, the Conservation Commission. I asked if they'd been consulted. He hasn't been consulted. He doesn't know what, what's going on there. I kept walking across uh, t four off and on ramps, and one of them is very treacherous. You can't see the cars coming down if you're coming from Marlboro and you're coming off the second ramp. You're all of a sudden in the pathway with your, with your walking. And then I looked at the bridge, and the bridge has a, a the uh, abutment on the front of it is shaped at a 45 degree angle, comes out onto the road. So you're going to have to build a bridge that's probably going to be five or six feet above the road. And that bridge is going to be about 200 feet long. It's going to have, uh, obviously, an abutment wall and then uh, a screen. And uh, that's going to be very, very expensive. 495 has two lanes going over, as we all know. And when they plow snow in the winter, I don't know if you've ever had your, ha your car bit hit. When cars go over there, they, sh they throw that snow across and over the top of 495. It lands on West Main Street. They, there's no screens. Some, some of the roads you'll see around the country have screens. This one doesn't have a screen on either, on either side of the bridge. So there's going to need to be a screen there. I'm just wondering, without a set of plans, not asking the state or the federal government if there's any possibility of some kind of a uh, cooperation that they could they could maybe either do this or pay for half of it or pay for a percentage of it. How can we vote for nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars, forty buck forty thousand bucks shy of a million on a, a sidewalk that's going down to uh, by the price chopper, following on down to uh, Downey Street and just stopping there. And we don't know about the safety of the kids. We don't know where they cross the off and on ramps. Are there gonna be buttons with lights? I asked John, he said, no, there wouldn't be any signals like that. There would just be some signs. Well, I'm worried about the safety of the people here. And I think we ought to table this until the DPW can do some research on it, come back next year, and we can do it next year. It's part of a program, the sidewalks. So consequently, uh, there's other speakers. I want to make an amendment, but I want to make sure everybody's heard. Uh, Mr. Moderator, should, should I, if I do the amendment, it's going to probably stop debate, right? I mean, do you have an amendment that, that you've written out at this point? Or? Yes. The uh, town council has reviewed it, and Josh has it up back. What, I, what I'm basically trying to do is cut well, out the $960,000 expenditure yeah. and just do the sidewalk for the $100,000 this year. 
So, um, Josh, do you have, have you seen the specific amendment? Excuse me, um, well, Tom, I, I know this is out of order, but I do have a question on the Wood Street. No, it, Mr. Terry is making an amendment. I just want to. I'm asking if Mr. Terry would mind waiting till I say what I'm going to say and then make well, he, the amendment. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Jackie Foden, Zoni 12 Wood Street. I, I would prefer to see the amendment and then as we have discussion on the amendment, if you want to make a, a comment or a suggestion, let's do it in that fashion. So do we have the amendment up, Josh? Yes. Um, Josh is going to put an amendment up, but he's going to change the $1,060,000 to $100,000, which will take care of just Wood Street. And this will automatically eliminate the uh, West Main Street part of the job. So your, your, your amendment would substitute for $1,060,000, yeah. 100000 And cross out West Main. And cross out West Main, and so it would relate strictly to Wood Street. Correct. Okay. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Okay. So the, there has been amen, an amendment which has been seconded. Is there discussion on the amendment? On my right. No, on my left. Hi, Joe Markey, 39 Ash Street. Um, I'm uncomfortable voting on an amendment without having heard from DPW themselves on this article. Mr. Westerling, would you like to comment? Through you, Mr. Moderator, uh, one of the things that I love about working for this community is the challenges that I'm faced with. <clears throat> a number of years ago, town meeting voted $1.5 million for the design and construction of sidewalks on four different roads in town. And we accomplished that, and we have the money up front so that we can design it and then put it out to build, excuse me, put it out to bid and then build the sidewalks as town meeting wishes. These two locations were selected by a survey that was done by the planning board, which looked at where the community wanted to see sidewalks, and then it was prioritized by the planning board and further refined through the budget process. So what we've got here <coughs> is an estimate. We looked at this on a preliminary basis with the engineers, and I want to thank Mr. Terry for pointing out all the challenges that are faced when you're looking to build a sidewalk from essentially Lumber Street to Downey Street. There's 495. If any of you have been uh, along um, in Milford where the bike trail goes under 495, <laughs> you'll see how that can be accomplished. So there are challenges, but there are also workarounds and design uh, configurations. Again, comments on my right. Is there a comment relating to the amendment? Yes, Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. I, I'm against the amendment. Uh, I think that, I, I love Mr. Terry, I love your voice, I love your presence. Um, but as a member of the planning board, we've had discussions going way back to Mr. Wisemantle's time. Um, and this is a plan that's coming together. Uh, I think it's very expensive, but there are a lot of challenges going under a federal highway. Uh, Milford's done it by tunneling, by crossing with yellow lights. I would assume for this price tag, there would be yellow lights to warn people that people are crossing. Um, otherwise, I'm in full support of it, and I would be against making this amendment at this point. On my left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick Road. Um, I understand that the article listed four potential sidewalks, and only two were moved in the motion document. So before we can speak to removing one, um, I, I think I'd like some understanding of why the other two were not chosen. Uh, Mr. Westerling, is, is, were there four or, or were there simply two? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, there were four. Uh, through the budget deliberative process, it was reduced down to two. And again, Mr. Moderator, I understand there was some robust discussion amongst the selectmen <clears throat> on the choice of the final two. If we're proposing to pull a million dollars out of the budget it, on, to not do West Main, it would seem there's an opportunity to potentially do one or both of the others. So I'd, I'd like some understanding of that before we vote on the motion to remove the West Main. May I, may I speak to that? Um, Ms. Wright. The four locations were 
the uh, West Main Street, as has been discussed, for 960,000. Um, the Wood Street, which was 100,000. That is, I believe, Proctor down to the DPW. There is the um, Hayden Row Street on the side, on the um, east side. There is already sidewalk on the west side, but this would put um, sidewalk on the east side, I believe, going down to Chestnut. Is that correct? And then finally, a small amount of sidewalk on Wild Road, which was for $40,000 um, in an attempt to keep our budgets down. Um, this would have been uh, a total of about $1.5 million. The Board of Selectmen discussed these alternatives, felt there already is sidewalk on Hayden Row, although not on both sides. We decided that Wild Road is a very minor road. It already has partial sidewalk. And we felt that the fund should be spent in the areas that were most needy. In particular, that um, west end of town has no connectivity whatsoever for the lake area to get over to Price Chopper or up to the shopping area and vice versa. We have focused much of our efforts on the downtown area and the area around the schools, which are very deserving, but we felt this was both a dangerous area and a deserving area that needed um, equal attention. We'd like to spend 1.5 million, but we felt it was prudent to try to reduce these expenses this year in light of our budget and our desire to keep that tax impact within the 2.5, um, which we have accomplished. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, I'm actually speaking against the amendment. I'd almost want to see it reversed. I actually live in that lake neighborhood and had a son about six years ago clipped by a car turning uh, right from Downey Street onto West Main Street. Uh, thankfully, he wasn't hurt that bad. Um, a bike was totaled. Um, but we are very much, there is a sidewalk that goes up South Street on one side. But if you're in the heart of a very congested neighborhood, turning down Downey Street, the kids are trying to get their friends on West Elm, things like that, they can't get there. They can get up to the light and cross over where it's safer, but they they, they want to go down because it's it's quicker, and then if there was a sidewalk there, it'd be safer. But you know, there's a lot, a lot of kids that are riding their bikes, whipping up and down there, and you know, walking and joggers every single day. We are a very congested neighborhood that really could use this. On my left, Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. In the grand, so I think the the uh, previous speaker answered one of my questions with regard to the, just the rationale behind uh, what was driving this this project. Because I think in the grand scheme of things, of all the things that DPW could be doing, a million dollars on sidewalks. I'm I'm curious to know where this would rank in terms of the priority of other things uh, that we could spend the million dollars on just for overall either DPW projects, town safety projects. Where does this rank from a priority perspective? Uh, is that best answered by you, John, or by capital improvements? I'll take a stab at it, Mr. Moderator. All right, go ahead. Uh, thankfully, town meeting tonight voted on all of our other priorities this year. <laughs> this is the remaining priority. Okay, so was was this uh, uh, was this motion uh, in order of priority? Because this is what number twenty three, I think. So is this number? Is this basically the lowest priority of the other uh, <clears throat> motions that were put forth tonight? Through the moderator, I had no I had no way of uh, ordering or selecting which ones came up first. Okay, thank you. You're On my right. Hi, I'm Michael and Holmes. I live at 5 Holt Street. I have mobility issues. And I have called in three almost accidents, leaving Price Chopper going down the hill. You do understand, I mean, I think you understand, or people who use that exit certainly understand that people are not attentive at high volume traffic. They're not, they're simply not. And Literally, there were two cars, and there are distracted drivers at all times. And so these, um, 
The converging lanes, we have several things going on right there. We have a right hand, we have two right hand turn lanes, then we have <laughs> an exit that's supposed to merge into, and you're not supposed to make a left, but they always want to merge right in front of Cumbies. They come dashing down and merge ahead. So that's fine, I don't care, I'm old. I <laughs> I can afford five minutes, but you can't afford to have people hit there, and I do think that that's what it's going to lead to. There's not, simply not enough space in the camp of the hill and the desire of kids, young people driving, people driving home who can't spend, <laughs> they come up behind me now. It's a dis I think it's a disaster waiting to happen. So the I, town, I think the town will be sued because of it. Can you, well, just clarify then, are you in favor of? What do you think? <laughs> I'm a dramatically opposed to this. I'm not opposed to sidewalks. I really, truly am not. I love sidewalks. This is a disaster. I, I really do believe that this, having seen almost disasters, knowing how kids drive, and adults anxious to be home. I, I vehemently oppose it. Just, just to clarify, you support the motion to, to remove West Main Street sidewalks. Okay, on my left. Mr. Moderator, Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. I understood that the state was looking at reconfiguring the on-off ramps at 45. Uh, I-45 in West Main, rather, and how would that impact these sidewalks and the projects? How would they be coordinated? Mr. Westerling, do we have any understanding of what the state might be considering? At three, Mr. Moderator, the only realignment of ramps that we're aware of is at the intersections of 495 and the Mass Pike and 495 and Route 9. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware and the town manager is not aware of any proposed realignments here on West Main Street. Okay. I just asked that be looked into because I thought I read that somewhere and I was wondering how they were going to do that and impact West Main. Thank you. On my right. Go ahead. Dave, Dave Paul for the Planning Board. We do have that on an agenda coming up, the interchange of 495 and the Mass Pike. Uh, what does that, but what does that mean? When you say we have that on the agenda, that's... The Planning Board. But as it relates to state action or? Um, I, I think she just had a question about uh, upcoming projects. If I misspoke, that's fine. Okay. On my left. Hello. I'm going to make it simple. If you build this million dollar, um, million dollar walkway, it'll save a life, maybe two or three. If you don't, there'll be an act. There'll be a you know casualty at that point of roadway. Thank you. On my right. Hi, I just wanted to uh, Stacia Frederick Crozy, Seven Lilac Court. I just wanted to speak against the amendment. Um, I don't know if we can move to move forward without the amendment or what the next step is, but I do think it is very important that we have sidewalks where 495 is. Um, we have a whole section of town that needs to be connected to the other half of town. I have a kid who actually was looking at a job at Price Chopper, he doesn't drive. He was like, can I ride my bike? And I was like, absolutely not. That is not a safe area to ride your bike. There is not a sidewalk there. We need to continue to address this. And on my left. Samantha Dings, three wordy circle. I move to call the question. Okay. So the, uh, the question has been called with respect to ending debate on the amendment to the, to the main motion. So the, the amendment that we're voting on would limit the expenditure to $100,000 and specifically for sidewalks on Wood Street as had been illustrated. Does everyone understand what we're voting on? So those in favor of the amendment to limit sidewalks and the cost What's the point of order? Yeah, all right. All those in favor of calling the question. Any opposed? All right. The question has been called, so we've ended debate. 
We're now going to vote on <clears throat> the amended motion. Do you understand the amended motion? All right. All those in favor of the amendment to the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay, it's clear majority opposed. So now we return to the motion as it was presented. All right. Can't hear you. Is there any further discussion associated with the main motion? Is this, can I ask a question on Wood Street now? It, we're back to the main okay. motion, so yes. Thank you. I am just asking why we're only going to repair the sidewalks from Pro Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street, I'm sorry, from Proctor to Walker Street. I don't know if you've walked down Wood Street from the top of the hill where I live, but in front of my house there was a sidewalk repair a few years ago when they did repair on the street. And in front of my house the sidewalk's been repaired. As you go down to 20, 24, 26, 28 Wood Street, down to Elm Street, the sidewalks are falling apart. So I don't understand how the town can justify spending $100,000 and not starting at the top of the hill where the sidewalks are already broken, crumbled, and falling apart, and just replacing a section and having gaps in the sidewalk. And I'd like clarification on that. Mr. Westerling. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Just to be clear, this is for construction of new sidewalks? That's not what the article says. It says to authorize the town to approve with the, for repair, rehabilitation, renovation, construction, and reconstruction Three, along West okay. Main and Wood Street. All right, let's, let's allow Mr. Westerling to answer. Through you, Mr. Moderator, that's broad language to cover. Very the, broad. No, to please, cover, no, don't interrupt. To cover the the design and construction of new sidewalks, in this case on Wood Street from Proctor, uh, where we ended sidewalk construction with our last phase, to join to the sidewalk that was built in front of the DPW garage, continue along the DPW garage, which we don't need to touch, and extend that to Walker Street. Um, so this is for construction of new sidewalks. Earlier, the town meeting approved $54,000 in the DPW's operating budget which is an annual appropriation that we use to repair sidewalks. So with the comments that I've heard this evening, we will certainly look at uh, repairing sidewalks on Wood Street and how those fit into the priority of the other sidewalks. And my next question, is there an easement required in front of my house for the sidewalk repair by any chance? I'd like transparency. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, if there, is, if there are existing sidewalks, um, there, there is no easement required. Thank you. On my left. Point of order, Mr. Moderator. Quite a few of the people around me think that the boat was uncleared. Uh, would you mind reconsidering your boat as in having a standing boat? I know it would, would take a, a, lot of, a lot of knee bending, but I'm pleading. All right. I mean, it, 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 while it didn't seem unclear to me, I, I suppose we could use some exercise at this point. And, and so we'll go back to, uh, to a standing count with respect to the motion, the amended motion, which was to limit the expenditure to $100,000 and the work on Wood Street. All those in favor of limiting construction to Wood Street and limiting the budget to $100,000, please stand. Raise your green cards. No. Did they Eight on the stage. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, center front five. <laughs> stage, center front five. 
stage center front five. Right rear, 19. Just to clarify, I'm doing, is that stage right or auditorium right? Stage, stage right is over here. That stage left, was that 19? Anybody understand what? Left front, six. Left front, six. Back right, 34. Back right, 34. Do we have left rear and center rear? Center rear, 32. Did we have back left? No, I, well, I have, yeah. Let's go over these numbers again. I had stage, stage eight. Stage left rear was how many? Yes, stage left front. So this side. Six. Okay, stage center rear, 32. Stage center front five. Stage right rear, 34. Stage right front, 19. Correct? This, okay, this, so there is no, all right. So stage right was 34 encompassing the whole right side. Okay, all those opposed stand and raise your green cards. Stage is six opposed. Center rear, 12. Center rear, 12. Right side, 30. 30, Center. 30 on the right, okay. Center front, 32. Center front, 32. Front left, 21. 21 left front. Left in the back, 26. 26. Okay, that motion did fail, 127 to 104. Okay, so we're back to consideration of the original motion. Is there any further discussion? Am I right? Uh, Russ Greve, 24 Nicholas Road. Uh, in the process of construction on this West Main Street section, uh, if there's a cost overrun, uh, how will that be handled? Will all the projects stop, or will we be coming back to town meeting to cover that? Through the moderator, as with any project, if the, if the estimates for construction come in greater than the appropriation, we'll have to come back and seek additional funding. Mr. Moderator, does that mean there will be no, no uh, work commenced without a, a $960,000 cost for the West Main Street section? Well, let, let's clarify this first. There's a million sixty that would be appropriated. Okay. Um, can you, Mr. Westling, can you clarify if 
let's say the, the, the bids come in at a million one, how would you proceed at that point? How would the town proceed at that point? Um, through the moderator, we would uh, look to see if we can't make minor changes to the design and therefore the construction to be able to come in under the appropriation. And, and failing that, would you choose one project or another? Uh, through the moderator, we're going to have to look at the two projects in total. Uh, again, as was pointed out earlier, we don't currently have a specific design. So we'll have to look at the two <coughs> projects and determine if we want to bid those separately or bid those as a whole. Does that clarify it for you? Uh, I think so. However, uh, I'm just not clear. Once we get into, you know, you, you get your foot in the pond and then pretty soon, oh, we're only one third and we, we all, we, we got a bid for whatever the 1106, but we have cost overruns now. So you'd be coming back to town meeting for those cost those runs, if they so happen. Uh, through the moderator again, as with any capital project that is appropriated funds, uh, if we don't have the necessary funds, we'll have to come back to town meeting and seek either a <coughs> clarification of the sidewalk, the location, or seek additional funding. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Okay. On my left. Uh, Dan Terry, 9 John Matthew Road. Um, it, it seems as though the primary benefit for the West Main Street portion, based on the comments that I've heard tonight, is for uh, bicycles. And I, I wonder if, um, and, and maybe this is a question for public safety, but is, is the design for this, and are we going to encourage bicycle traffic on these sidewalks? My understanding for bicycles is that they're to use roadways. So this isn't necessarily a, a, an adequate solution, and should we be looking at a solution for bicycles along this area? Through the moderator, uh, the, the comment is absolutely spot on. Sidewalks are not built for bicycles, but if we build the sidewalk and there are bicyclists that want to get from one end to the other, they can dismount their bicycles and walk them on the sidewalks safely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great idea, thank you. <laughs> Uh, th through the moderator, again, this, this was uh, a planning board survey for where we wish to build sidewalks in town uh, for, for pedestrian access. On my right. Uh, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, Mr. Wesseling, is there any chance that this could go be extended beyond Downey Street all the way to School Street? <coughs> uh, through the moderator, I think that there are some overarching challenges there. I said that I love the challenges of the job, but uh, with the, the, the two causeways that cross over Lake Maspinock, I don't know that there's adequate width in there to put in a five and a half foot wide sidewalk at this point. On my left. Francis DeYoung, Three Door <coughs> Lane. Just to address the previous comment, and being a member of the planning board, although speaking as a member of the public, and as a runner in town, it was developed for, for walkers and people that want to commute. There was the development uh, over off of Lumber Street, and the thought was to be able to people could walk over to Price Chopper and do those things. And as a member of the running club, to be able to kind of cross that area without the impediment to some degree of the traffic on 495, and to be able to get over to the west side of town uh, was another draw and another reason for de developing these sidewalks for pedestrians. Thank you. On my right. Carol Dever, 47 Chamberlain Street. I fully support being able to get from one side of 495 to the other in a safe manner. Um, what concerns me is the description by Mr. Terry does not indicate to me that it's going to be particularly safe if you just have to kind of cross those ramps. So my question is, during the design process, is there going to be an opportunity for the public to give input to the design before construction starts and monies are expended? Through the moderator, my expectation is that yes, we would hold a, a public informational meeting and look at those things. We'll also have to work very closely with MassDOT because this is their right of way and uh, <coughs> potentially impacts their traffic flow, so they're also going to weigh in on the design. However, we've seen again safely uh, just locally uh, in Milford where the, the rail trail crosses four ramps and crosses under Route 495, how it can be accomplished in a safe manner. Thank you. On my left. Uh, Brian Douglas, Greenwood Road. 
So it sounds to me as if we don't actually have a design or a plan yet. We've just, I mean, uh, we've basically guesstimated the million six. Would that be an accurate statement? Uh, through the moderator, we looked at this with our design engineers, VHB, who designed the other sections of town that we built sidewalks for, for the $1.5 million. And the estimate was based off of their review of it and the average cost of construction and looking at some of the other challenges that we face going through that area. Would we be using our own uh, staff, if you will, for the, design, or for the design and construction, or would we be outsourcing this to a third party general contractor? Through the moderator, we would be going through a, a third party contractor. So would it make sense to perhaps get bids on designs and then come back with designs and figures behind them to vote on those as opposed to voting on a million sixty thousand beforehand because uh, frankly uh, I don't know what I'm getting for that million six other than a sidewalk but I don't know with any great detail uh, any additional safety measures that have been taken uh, or uh, any potential challenges that we might incur in, in building that I mean a million a millions I mean when you put two commas on it it, it gets my attention Absolutely. Um, through the moderator, if we get into the design, uh, and, and again, the way that we did the last phase of sidewalks, $1.5 million, was to get all the money up front, uh, excuse me, to appropriate the funds at once for both design and construction. So that's what the intent was with the approach here. If we get into the design and we find that there are overarching elements, uh, we would not borrow the $960,000 in this case for West Main Street and look at our options. Thank you. On my right. Ken Dietz, 44 Alexander Road. Um, regards to the Milford bikeways and all of the crossings they have on 85 and other places, they have crosswalk lights. Can you put crosswalk lights as part of the crossings of the 495 exits? Three, Mr. Moderator, my view of those areas in my riding my bicycle there, there are not flashing lights at the interchange of Route 495. Uh, the flashing lights are further to the north on uh, Route 85. No, I understand that, but I'm saying where you, where this West Main sidewalk is going, it's going to cross two ramps on one side and two ramps on the other side, and I'm saying, are you going to consider putting uh, crosswalk lights at those uh, interchanges. So that's 495 in West Main. Yet through, through the moderator, we will work very closely with MassDOT and we will implement as many uh, safety measures as we can that MassDOT will allow us without impeding their traffic flow of on-ramps and off-ramps. All right, because it is extremely dangerous there. Thank you. On my left. John Cardillo, 84 Winter. Um, I think Milford and Hopkinton are really quite different. And when you're taking the exit from Hopkinton down to Milford, it's a little bit of a curve, and then it's pretty much of a straightaway, and you can see fairly far in front of you. Um, when you're coming off all those turns at uh, getting on and getting off here in, in, in Hopkinton, uh, those are pretty tight uh, curls. And I've seen cars come through there there's yield signs, but I, there's got to be either a stop sign or uh, some kind of impede. Um, it's going to force people to look in front of them. I can, I can just see that, it, yeah, maybe it, it, it'll appear to be safer, but in the long run, I, I think it's going to create more problems. And I think uh, community involvement and um, uh, making uh, everyone aware that the, this might indeed happen and allow for uh, public comment, I think, is critical. On my right. Uh, Michael and Holmes, 5 Holt Street. And I do, I mean, I love sidewalks. I would love, if I could, to walk to Price Chopper. I don't feel it's safe, certainly not now. And I wouldn't feel it was safe without crossing lights, respected crossing lights was ticketing being commenced immediately. Um, how far up the hill also does the sidewalk go? Sorry, through the, through if it's the, knitting or if it's knitting 
places together. Does it get to angels? Where does it go? Uh, through the moderator, the, uh, the way that the article is written, it goes from Lumber Street to Downey Street. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't go to angels. So it Correct. doesn't, how many streets does it cross? Uh, it there are three things on 495. So it All three of the 495 and South Street. You've got four positions in which to be needing, let's not say in which to be hit, let's say in which to be needing cross lights. I've crossed where there's a walkway painted <laughs> from um, Golden <clears throat> Spoon to get to a hair appointment. I was almost hit. I thought, well, that isn't safe. <laughs> it's just not safe without I urge you to consider more public input. Um, that, that's it, thank you. On my left. Uh, Michelle Murdoch, 53 School Street. I move the question. All right, a uh, motion has been made to call the question. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of ending debate, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, we're gonna take a standing vote on this because it requires a two-thirds majority. If I'm correct. So, we're voting on the main motion, which is to expend 1060 on sidewalks that would both be on the south side of West Main as well as on Wood Street. All those in favor, please rise and hold your green cards up. Seven on the stage. Are you, are you Left front, 17. Left front, 17. Right side, 30. Right side, 30. Mr. Moderator, center front, 27. Center front, 27. Mr. Moderator, center rear, 14. Center rear, 14. Left rear 29. Left rear 29, okay. <clears throat> All those opposed, stand and hold your green cards. Seven on the stage. Mr. Moderator, center front seven. Center front seven. Right side thirty five. Right side, 35. Left rear, 12. Left rear, 12. Center rear, 30. Center rear, 30. Left front, 12. Left front, 12. So I have 124 to 103. So yeah, it's 124 in favor, 103 opposed, and so it does not reach the two-thirds majority, and so thus fails.
Article 24, school bus parking lot. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. Okay. And appropriations, Mr. Manning. Article 24, school bus parking lot. We move the motion as written in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this is uh, an extra $300,000 from a general fund borrowing. This project will include additional funds needed for the implementation of a master plan that will better accommodate parking, traffic circulation, parent drop-off pickup, and bus movement on the campus, mainly at Hoppington High School. This appropriation will supplement funds that were previously appropriated uh, 400000 in fiscal year 2019. Does the school co committee wish to make any comments on this? Not, I mean, it's not necessary, but. <laughs> so in a general sense, um, in 2000, 18 Maytown meeting, um, we had secured the original appropriation of 400,000 prior to meeting all our obligations and per permitting uh, process through the town. Once we got through all those permitting processes, it required engineering changes to our original design. That, er that uh, engineering changes increased the cost of the parking lot by the 300,000. Some of the significant things were basically we needed to raise the entire elevation of the parking lot, so that required additional material. Uh, there was additional stormwater collection and treatment devices, landscaping, guardrail and fencing due to that elevation increase, additional lighting requirements, additional excavation, and an asphalt adjustment as a year of market change. Are there any questions? Uh, Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street. Um, not so much a question, but I just want to speak against this. Um, I was against it before, um, and the fact that we're almost doubling the price of it, I'm against it now. Um, while I appreciate the benefits of um, parking our buses in town, um, I think this lot is just too small. There's snow removal, storage issues. We're parking cars the, of the bus drivers there as well as the buses themselves. Um, and I, I just, I, I think that when we double the price, I, I really question um, whether it's, it's still worth the potential savings and if there's not a, a potentially better site to park our buses in town. On my right. Hi, Deborah Feinberg, um, 12 Presswick Drive. I too echo Gary's um, response um, about how uh, environmentally I don't feel that the congestion and the, and the smog that the buses are gonna create is gonna be a wholesome environment for the kids. But my, my second point is if we're planning to do an expansion in the rear and there's already plumbing and facilities to do that, is it really an auspicious idea to put an expensive parking lot? Mr. Moderator, I do have a presentation, um, depending on the questions, was whether I would show that. So Josh, I would ask you if you could pull that up, please. So we can just... Uh, Go to the next slide, please, Josh. So these are the costs that um, I just ran through quickly in terms of the additional costs of where we are to get to this additional appropriation. Um, and just to take you through the history in the next slide, uh, in 2017, we embarked really in looking at the campus um, as a whole and looking at a master plan. Um, some of the things that we're looking at to evaluate were parking, location of and size of student parking, staff parking, visitor parking, and determining space for bus parking. At the time here, it was for 28 buses. 
I will tell you in 2020, we will have 29 buses. And in 2021, most likely we will have 30 buses. The next slide, we also were looking at the safety and that is looking at all users of the campus to be evaluated as it relates to lighting, security, both with gates and cameras, signage, and the distance from the buildings to the fields and a potential of a maintenance storage facility. So those were all of the things that we were looking at in terms of looking at this full campus plan. One of the things that came out in this study was the first phase was to look for a bus parking lot. So the current conditions, currently there is separation of bus and vehicle traffic at all of our schools except the middle school and the high school. Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins all have parent and um, vehicle traffic separated from where the buses are. So at the middle school and high school, you can see some of the statistics that we put forward, but basically each day there's an average of 1,700 middle school and high school students and over 160 vehicles together. We're kind of missed up on the slides, Josh. One more. So there's over 1,700 students and 160 vehicles all in the same place for dismissal. Next slide. So the goal of this school bus lot is not just to park the vehicles in town. It is that separation of the bus and vehicle traffic. And this is defined as best practices. It's the safety of the students and it is also maintaining our emergency access to the buildings around the campus. Next slide. So traffic flow, best practice, traffic engineers, when they're designing buildings, they are separating all different modes of traffic, whether it is vehicle, walkers, bicyclists, um, parent cars, student cars, bus um, traffic. So you'll see in the design of, of the Marathon building as an example, there is that separation. The middle school, high school right now is currently our only building with, that we do not have that separation of all those different modes of transportation. These are just a couple of quotes um, that talks about that as being best practice. And this next slide is also, um, they actually, this study actually shows kind of a picture of what we have where it just talks about that physical separation. Um, it, it's basically, um, you know, it, it's a design issue. So it's something that really needs to be addressed. So the next slide. So w when we were looking at where we could do this, we went through all different options around the campus. So what we did is looked at all different places where we could stage the buses um, for the dismissal and the drop off and try to create some type of separation. So in these next couple slides, you'll see all the places where we looked at and the red X's uh, show you all of our conflict points, whether it is blocking emergency access, blocking existing parking or blocking um, traffic as, the, as we're going through dismissal. This shows an alternative of having it in the front. The next slide shows an alternative of using the back, which basically takes up our emergency access all through the backside. The next slide brings them up through the middle, again, taking up all of your emergency access roads, and you can still see more conflict points. Just something that you can look at in that slide right there. Um, when you look at the two wings off the back of the high school, the shorter of the two is where those six classrooms would go. So there will not be interference between adding those classrooms and the bus parking lot, just to clarify. Okay, next slide, Josh. And this was one other options that we looked at. So we really did look all around the campus for the best area to be able to create
create this new drop off and um, pick up procedures with the buses. And the next slide. And where we landed was out on the field, which is behind the high school. It keeps open our emergency access. It keeps open all access to any parking, any live traffic flow, and it became the best area to have those buses parked, staged for drop off and, and pick up and dismissal. So the next slide, basically uh, to your point, we're talking about enrollment and space, space issues. And you are correct, we have been looking at the high school buildings. So this next slide, this is what Dr. Kavanaugh was just speaking to. Those green squares show where we could put additions or portable classrooms if needed. And you can see it does not get down into that emergency access road. It does not block where the buses would be coming in and out, and it does not go out and infringe onto that field, which would become the parking lot. So the next piece that we looked at was what else does this do for us? You know, not only is this separating all the modes of transportation and keeping our students safe, but it also improves the traffic flow around the whole campus. It has the potential to increase parking in the future, and it also has a financial impact for the town. So this next slide. If we were to lose the, what is now the staging for the buses, and that becomes parking, we would be able to add 92 additional parking spaces. And as you can hear from all the growth, um, you know, these spaces would be quickly used up. It would give us an ability to pull some of our students closer, um, reconfigure where staff and students are parking, getting back again to what we were talking about, proximity of parking um, and to the buildings. Excuse me. This next slide shows a different traffic pattern, again, utilizing that bus um, parking lot, but we would also be able to add 55 additional spaces. And currently on the campus right now, there are 481 existing spaces. And the last slide talks to the financial impact. Uh, we were able to negotiate with the school bus contractor that if we were able to bring the buses into town, um, they would be willing to give us a reduction in our contract of $50,000. And of course, having the buses housed in the town would bring in uh, financial impact to the town of Hopkinton in the way of excise tax. So that gives you the financial impact as well. On my right. Frank Durso, 173 Saddle Hill Road. Um, I don't think you can find a bigger fan of this idea. Uh, I've been working on this when I, since I've been on the Green Committee, 2009. We met with your predecessor's predecessor's predecessor. Um, I agree with my colleague on the planning board. I don't see why you need another uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars. I don't see why this project couldn't be met with the money you've got last year. Um, I don't see how these numbers add up to, we were looking at $150,000 savings per year just based on gas. Is the school district paying for gas separately or is the contract cover all the gas that, uh, that they'll be saving? Because you're giving up $50,000 right there based on 25 buses. So the bus contract right now does not have a fuel clause. So when we had a fuel clause in the bus contract, the price for gas was a, getting closer to $4 a gallon. Mm -hmm. So as the price of gas was coming down, the school department was benefiting from that. So that was savings under that contract. Now that the price of gas has come down, a fuel clause at this point in time, the price of gas is only going up. So it actually is not to our benefit. So we do not pay for gas, it's built into the contract. In 2009 at the time, gas for diesel was about $3 a gallon, and that's what we were basing our numbers on. And for 25 buses driving from a rectangular parking lot downtown Ashland, uh, nine miles, four times a day into Hopkinton, and we're still paying for it a decade later, we wasted over a million dollars trying to get something like this done. Um, Frank, we're we're desperately trying to get to Article 25 before we hit 11 o'clock. So I, I agree with my I, colleagues. What's, what's, 
I don't see why we can't take the front of the, uh, alternative number one slide, please. You, we can see that there's a big green circle there that's not being used that you can fit, easily fit 30 buses without that green area. I don't mean to be ironic, but from being on the former green committee, this, these buses parked in front of the, of the high school will be the easiest solution. Right now they're parked in a rectangle covered with tar in Ashland. We could do the same thing in Hobbiton yeah. for a lot less. Than Frank, it's, that redesign is not within the scope of this article. Well, we're getting it's, shown it's an either, alternative. It's either up or down with respect to the article as it's being presented. All right, I agree with my colleague. There are alternatives. They're not being looked at. I don't think this project is being managed as it should be. I feel frustrated. Thank you. All right. On my left. Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. Um, as a parent who drops off at the middle school and now the high school for several years, I think this redesign is entirely warranted. Um, the parking lot improvement, um, getting the school buses out of the flow of the parent traffic would be a, a great benefit. The additional money that's being asked for, 300000 according to the numbers that were just shown, which are, I assume, the most current numbers, would be paid for in three years. Um, this seems to me to be a great investment of the town's money, and I would support it. Thanks. On my right. Uh, two, Dave Paul's have a metal end drive. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is, if this gets voted down, what would be your next steps? What would you do, knowing that you've already had the 400000 but not getting the 300000 we would not be able to move forward with the 400,000. So in other words, buses would continue to be parked off, or not within the town. There would be no at this change. Point. Yeah. So I just want to echo some of the commands, real, that some of the comments real quickly that we've heard. I also believe that this is too small of a space and it's too close to the building itself. Um, I would suggest a different parking location for the buses where they could expand if you needed to. Um, I would also just suggest that you break it up into two. I am totally for the rerouting of traffic and everything and for the safety. I think that's a different issue than uh, finding a space for the buses to park because the two are independent of each other. Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain. Not until others have spoken. I'm sorry. On my right. Brendan Tedstone, 45 Pleasant Street. Um, just a couple of quick questions. Question number one. When does the bus, there was a $50,000 um, um, secession from the present bus contract. When does that present bus contract end? So we are just completing the first year of a three-year contract with two one-year extensions. Okay. And has the school department looked at parking buses at Center School, the now vacant Center School? So the bigger issue is really the drop-off in dismissal in separation of what happens when everyone is exiting the building at the same time. Thank you. On my left. Ted Barker Hook, 75 Grove Street. I live literally within shouting distance of the middle school, so I have some questions about how this will affect our neighborhood. Um, you mentioned that there needs to be lighting, security lighting. Is that 24-hour lighting? The new turf fields have already dramatically, much more than advertised, impact light pollution in our neighborhood. Is this going to be more? Uh, what time do the buses come and go? Will there be backup alarms happening at 5 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning? And if we create 92 new parking spaces, what will that do for traffic in our neighborhood? So I'll try to remember in order the, the, the lighting question. So this was um, stipulated by the planning board, what type of lighting was allowed. The light poles themselves, I believe, are 15 feet, and it is night sky compliant, down lighting only. So I don't believe that there would be um, dramatic effect to the lighting. Increasing the parking spaces of 92 this are, these are staff and parents and existing enrollment changes that are already happening. Um, so we're not inviting people that are not already existing onto the campus with the additional parking. Uh, it could alleviate some of the parking that happens along the loop road and within parking lots that are actually not spaces. Um, so people are parking not not in a space at, at the current time. 
and I don't recall the third question. Oh, so when the buses are in the parking lot, they're, they're always staged to be able to pull out directly. Um, so when they pull in, they're, they're pulling in so that when the, um, you never want to back up a bus, basically, is what it is. So they're pulled in in, a, in such a way that when they are ready to go, they leave. Straightforward. On my right. Uh, Ken Dietz, 44 Alexander Road. I have a couple of questions. My understanding was that the uh, buses are going to be parked uh, next to the Marathon School and, and that property, we, extra property we bought. That seems to be off the table now. Uh, secondly, if we don't get the extra 300000 appropriated tonight, then you're not going to do anything. So what's in the past, whenever a project has not gone forward, the money goes into the Selectman's general fund. Is that what's going to happen to 400000 from last year if we don't go forward with this? So this would be a borrowing. Uh, so basically, it would not be, it would be money that would not be borrowed. Okay, thank so you. So it would not go to the general fund. We don't have it. All right, good. On my left. Nancy Cavanaugh, 25 Priscilla Road. I am here speaking as a parent, but also as the chair of the school committee. And the thing that we considered, and, and as a parent who drops off at both the middle school and the high school, that's really important here is the safety of getting the kids behind the school for unloading and loading in the buses. And I know that our public safety officials had spoken at our school committee meeting, and I don't know, I, I assume they're still here if they wanted to speak to that again. Uh, but also the enrollment that we have been talking about all night and the impact that has had on our traffic. And my question, I guess, directed at both of your comments would be that the buses where they are currently queuing, if I am not mistaken, would be impacted and unable to queue properly there in the future with the additional buses uh, that will be necess necessitated by enrollment growth. True or false? As we continue, as, um, yeah, if you look at the, the uh, place where we are queuing up our buses now for um, pick up and drop off, as we continue to add buses, if enrollment continues to go in the same direction, it will become more and more difficult to fit all of the buses in there at the same time, which would mean that you would have some buses that are in that driveway between the middle school and the high school, and that would be another impediment to the traffic flow of parents. And just one more thought on that. If that becomes our bus parking lot where we park buses at night, during the day when children are in school and those buses aren't running, um, or when the buses are running, you'll have to have 30 spaces for bus drivers to park their car. On my right. Uh, can you go back to the uh, best practice of the traffic flow, please? I had a question about that. It's minor, you know, just passed it, the, uh, the one with the picture. But if this is a best practice, this goes back to 2004. Is that still operational? So this is uh, from a paper. Basically, it says um, site with a layout to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's so this still is, okay. So good. This, ha this having the, the buses and the parents together with just a small median um, as, as that separation, mm -hmm. what they're pointing out is this is exactly what you want to avoid okay. in a design. And that stood the test of time because it's, yes. I'm not used to best practice being that old. Okay, yes. and the other question might have covered this, but does this account for the expansion that you talked about earlier in your previous presentation? It does, so this bus parking lot now we have designed to accommodate these number of buses and the increase. It also holds the cars for the drivers. So if we continue to add buses, basically what we would do is we would take the places where the um, driver's vehicles are and they would have to carpool themselves to the parking lot. So okay. the buses would become the priority. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the effort that went into this. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. On my left. John Pavlo, 15 Ash Street. I was on the center school reuse committee for a year and a half. One of our criteria was fit into the neighborhood. Parking buses at center school, which is a residential neighborhood, was ruled out by the committee and also presented to the selectmen. So yes, it was considered. It was not. Um, in any way really considered as a fit for center school, especially with the gym being used now. 
you would end up having, if with the buses there, there'd be no places for any of the cars to park. There weren't places to park buses when it was an active school, and there's very little room around that school. Thank, Thank you. you. On my right. Hi, Don Ronan, 211 Hayden Row. Um, I'm speaking as a parent that drops off every day at the high school, as well as Hopkins. And safety is right now an accident waiting to happen. Um, I think it's also important to mention that last year we had police and administration out there morning and afternoon watching all of this traffic, the danger to the students. We have inexperienced drivers. We have Hopkins parents that cross that, you know, dismissal time as well. So the, everything that has been set up this past year was kind of a Band-Aid um, knowing that it was going to be addressed. So safety, I think we're sort of missing that that's, that's really a factor here. Thank you. On my left. Uh, Daniel Haskins, 21 Ash Street. Seems to me a lot of work has gone into this. Uh, a lot of thought seems to address safety issues and traffic issues and eliminate $100,000 a year contracts, so I appreciate that. On my right. Um, however much I do appreciate the research, um, I feel name and, that, name and address. Um, Deborah Feinbrug, 12 Prestwick Drive. Um, I do appreciate, appreciate the research that went into it. Um, I'm still not speaking for it. I think there are other satellite locations in Hopkinton which would still gain the, the benefit of the $50,000 and potentially the $100,000 um, and to create a different pathway for the buses in design. So I would really like this to be looked at. So I am not in favor of it, but I do encourage you to um, do another study and to not leave it alone and drop it. On my left. Yes, sir. Mike Shepard, uh, 11 Hill Street. Thank you. The, um, I rise in support of this article. The school committee has done over the last three or four years what I had hoped the DPW and the Board of Selectmen would have done with the sidewalk in the last article. Mm -hmm. They've designed it. They've had engineers do it. They've priced it. We know it's going to cost this much. This is a no-brainer. Uh, we have confidence in the school committee. We have confidence in the thing to do. This is going to come out fine. Um, you know, I have less confidence than the previous one, but we're not talking about that now. <laughs> I, again, I rise in support of this article. Thank you. And I'm not running for anything. <laughs> On my right. Leah Battle Rafferty in um, Five Meadowland, and I am a member of the Board of Assessors, but I am not speaking as such right now. Um, I wanted to, because there's been so much negative, I wanted to bring up kind of as a parent, what I went through last year, not, not this current year because they've done a lot of band-aids, but last year, I had my kids injured several times trying to get in the snow, in the cold, down to the loop where they're picking up the kids right now. This year as a band-aid, what they've done is you can wait until the buses leave. So then my kids are sitting out, you know, whatever weather until 2 to 10 so that we can go into the actual loop and pick them up. It is absolutely a safety issue. There is no easy way for those kids to get to where they need to get to right now. It's not about parking the buses overnight, though that is part of it. It is absolutely during that pickup and drop off time when the buses are in the way, the kids are trying to get out, and kids can get hurt. Um, so I am very pro this despite the raise and money because I, I do, I have experienced it as a safety issue. And again on my right. Oh, me, yeah. Um, <laughs> Charlie Hayes, one third, uh, I just want to move the question. <laughs> you knew that was going to happen. All those in favor of, uh, is there a second to that? Second. Is all those in favor of ending discussion? Any opposed? Okay, we have voted to end discussion. We're now ready for a vote. Article 24, school bus parking lot. 
We're going to take a, a standing vote because this is going to require two thirds. And uh, I'll note that uh, it's after 11 o'clock, so this is the last article under consideration. I would also ask that until we have completed voting, please don't leave the, leave the hall. All those in favor stand with uh, green cards elevated. Fifteen on the stage. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, center front twenty three. Twenty three center front. On the left rear, 31. Left rear, 31. Mr. Moderator, center rear, 15. Center rear, 15. <laughs> it's late. Front left, 21. Front left, 21. Right side, 41. 41 on the right side, okay. All those opposed, please rise with your green cards extended. None on the stage. Front left, three. Front left, three. Center front, eight. Center front, eight. Left rear, 16. Left rear, 16. Right, 13. Right, 13. Center rear, 20. Center rear, 20. Yeah. 60. Yeah. 146 in favor, 60 opposed. It meets the two-thirds majority and so passes. Okay. 
So, if you've had excitement this evening, come back tomorrow night, 7 p.m., for even more.